Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Mormon Stories Podcast. I am one of your co-hosts for today, John DeLynn, and I'm super happy to have a uh, riding shotgun, Gerardo Sumano. Hey, Gerardo. Hey, John. Man, you've been bringing great, uh, you've been planning and organizing great episodes uh, recently and longstanding for Mormon Stories, but today's a great one as well. So thanks for thanks for joining us. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to be here. Yeah. How are you feeling? Good. Good as always. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, today we have, uh, for the first time in Mormon Story Studios, but the second uh, time in person on video, the one, the only, the legend, Dr. Thomas Murphy. Hey, Thomas Murphy. Hello, John. Whoa. Hello, Gerardo. <laughs> it's great to be uh, be here, and I'm I'm really delighted that uh, Gerardo's part of this uh, project today, uh, and it, it's been fun talking a little bit with you and planning this. Uh, and I'm glad to be back on Mormon Stories. Yeah, yeah. For those who don't know uh, this friendly face and who don't know about Thomas and why I call him a myth and a legend, I've referred to him several times on the podcast. Uh, but I'll just give a really quick history as sort of my endorsement for why this is such an important day for us. And we're going to be spending all day with Thomas. Um, but when I uh, when I went through my faith crisis at Microsoft back in 2001, um, I stumbled on an article and or a news story about Thomas Murphy because he was probably the first person ever, or at least that I knew of, that sort of made the connection between kind of modern DNA science, Native Americans, and the Book of Mormon. So even before Simon Southerton, Simon Southerton published his book, Losing a Lost Tribe, which was also instrumental in my journey, I, in Washington, learned about this professor in Washington who was summoned to a disciplinary council simply for um, investigating the um, connection between Native American DNA and possible ties to, you know, Israelites or Hebrews or whatever language you want to use. And it was during that time that a disciplinary council was called on Thomas. And because the media got involved, the disciplinary council was called off. So he, Thomas, was fortunately able to avoid excommunication. But none of that has anything to do with how important his work has been as an anthropologist um, dealing with with Native peoples, with Native Americans, and uh, with Mormon studies. So we had Thomas Murphy on Mormon Stories, did we say six years ago? Six years ago. Six years ago. Yeah. It was in my house, and we kind of did a part one of Thomas Murphy's story, uh, but it's taken us this long to get back face-to-face -face and do part two. So I want to begin by saying... If you want to hear uh, Thomas Murphy's full story, pause this, go back, watch that first interview that we did with him. Um, we'll include it in the show notes. Between then and now, we've also done a second interview when the Bears Ears controversy uh, emerged uh, regarding protected lands in Utah. We had Angelo, now, now Dr. Angelo Baca yes. and uh, Th Dr. Thomas Murphy on to talk about that. So that's the second episode that we'll include in the show notes, um, a little bit more history. But today we're going to be doing three episodes, hopefully with, with Thomas, um, that are going to be in three different parts. So we're going to kind of do the part two of his interview um, that, that he's entitled uh, Environmental Anthropology in the Book of Mormon. And, but it's also just going to be kind of uh, the, the second part of your story. Correct. That's yeah. going to be the first interview for today. The second interview for today is going to be entitled Race and Gender in the Book of Mormon. And this is a really important issue because it's just going to be, it's going to be based on some important publications, uh, peer-reviewed journal articles that Thomas has authored or co-authored. Uh, one of them that I was most interested in is entitled, I love this title, Sin, Skin, and Seed, Mistakes of Men in the Book of Mormon. Uh, there are some other articles as well that inform uh, that part two that we're going to be doing today on race and gender in the Book of Mormon. And then part three, our third interview that we're going to try and cover today, is called Decolonizing the Book of Mormon with the Popol. Now it says Wooj. Is that the same thing as the Popol Vu that it, I 
Yes, that, that Popovu I... is is one way to to say okay. Popovuj. Yeah, Popovuj is a more accurate spelling of the Kiche. Right. Okay. Yeah, and I believe I'm always going to take your word over mine. So that's just what I that's that's how I pronounce it on my mission in Guatemala. Yeah, me too. And, and most Mormons and you, the, you two heard of? Yeah, yeah. It's the way I learned it, Popovu too. So okay, I, okay. I will probably slip and say that a few times. Okay, but uh, yeah, it's kind of like if we're going to have modern day scripture. And Thomas, one of the things I love about you is even though you are addressing, I think from the church's perspective critical, critical, I would say critical essential from the church's standpoint, it may feel like criticism, even though you're addressing really important topics. I think you're also very respectful to believers and to belief in general. And you walk that, that dance, you walk that line really well. Um, but I'm just really excited because I think all of these topics, I can't think of a more important area to focus on. If we're going to have sacred scripture, that it not be racist <laughs> right. and that it not contribute to the ongoing problem of racism in our country and in our world. Anything you want to say about that or anything else that I, well, my comments may be taken it is critical, but I intend them as constructive criticism. Yeah. Uh, and I think that hopefully there's something there that's helpful uh, for believers as well as doubters. Yeah. And, and I've been, uh, pleasantly surprised to see that you you even though you know years ago how long how long ago was your disciplinary council scheduled like how long ago was uh, that twenty years ago twenty years ago this yeah. year well uh, twenty years ago is when the article Lamanite Genesis Genealogy and Genetics appeared in in American Apocrypha and twenty or nineteen years ago was the disciplinary council okay yeah. And so even though you kind of had that brush with church discipline, my understanding is just in the past few years, you've been invited down to BYU to, to correspond with scholars there and to participate. So I don't think the church is viewing you as like a code red threat. <laughs> yeah, it, it is interesting the way things have come around. And, you know, I mean, the, the church did change the introduction to the Book of Mormon and, you know, try to make it more compatible with my research, which... You know, my my friends used to joke that my dissertation dissertation changed the word of God, but that's <laughs> I think a little over the top. But uh, the the colleagues that, especially the indigenous colleagues uh, at BYU and uh, within Mormon studies more generally, have been very gracious and uh, generous in their interactions with me, and I've uh, tried to return that. And I hope to share uh, a little bit of that that story uh, today. I, and I was also surprised that the, even the Mormon Social Science Association has elected me as the next president. I'm the president-elect in, in my current term. And, and then uh, when the Mormon Social Science Association meets in Salt Lake City, in, it'll be October of 2024, I'll take on the presidency of the Mormon Social Science Association. So it, having that difficult start in Mormon story in Mormon studies. Uh, it seems like things have come around. Uh, and I regularly collaborate with believers as well as non-believers, Mormons as well as non-Mormons, native scholars as well as uh, non-natives. Yeah. Are, are Rick Phillips and Ryan Cragen and Michael Nielsen all still involved in that organization? Yes, indeed. Yes. Love those guys. Yeah, they are yeah, great. Those are great guys. I'm sure there's other people I'm forgetting to mention. Uh, Jana Reese is the current oh. president. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. She's really okay. Cool. Well, um, really quickly, um, I would love it, even though we're going to encourage people to go back and watch your first part. If you could give like a one or two minute recap of like whatever you want to share about, um, your your history, your CV, your career, you know your your background that would be like that if if they just want to start now, just to give them a, a taste of whatever you think would be essential for them to enjoy the rest of today. What what would you want to give as an overview? Well, kind of the quick version is that you know I was was raised uh, in Southern Idaho in the LDS Church and uh, raised with. Uh, stories of having a Lamanite ancestor 
uh, in the distant past that my grandmother used to refer to as an Indian princess, uh, which I would learn in my graduate studies was quite a problematic term. Uh, but I kind of grew up with this connection, a deep connection with, with the Book of Mormon and with uh, Mormonism uh, and wanted to explore that uh, in more in depth in, when I went uh, to school uh, to, in, at the University of Iowa. In kind of in the earlier story, I, I, I tell a lot of the detail of my bout at uh, Utah State and how I ended up at the University of Iowa. And then I earned a bachelor's degree there in anthropology and religion. Then I went on to the University of Washington for graduate school where I earned a PhD in anthropology. And my dissertation was called Imagining Lamanites, Native Americans in the Book of Mormon. And a chapter in that dissertation, as well as an independent article published prior to the dissertation uh, called Lamanite Genesis, Genealogy, and Genetics, uh, explored that connection between DNA and the Book of Mormon. And that, that is what I'm most known for. It's not the research that's closest to my heart in that sense. I mean, I enjoy doing it and, and I enjoy talking about it, but and it's uh, and it's fair to say that to Rardo's point, you were, if not highly influential, maybe responsible for that change in the Book of Mormon. Uh, yeah, and, and undoubtedly page. Simon Southerton had a significant yeah, role in right. in that as well. With and, with Simon. Yeah. yeah, and I and I do think that the the voices of native Mormons within the church were also a very important part in that, in that change. Mm. Uh, and you know, that is what I'm, of course, best known for. But the even that dissertation, there's only one chapter on DNA. The rest of it is kind of a broad look at Native American uh, origins, uh, Native, Native Americans in anthropology. Uh, and we're going to go into some of that uh, today, uh, into that, that broader context. Uh, and, and a big part of the dissertation is also about Nahua Mormons uh, in uh, Mexico. And so that plays a really important part of it that doesn't get as much attention. Uh, I don't get as much opportunity to talk on podcasts about this, the rest of this stuff. So I'm delighted to be able to do that today. Well, sometimes our audience likes red meat. You know what I mean? <laughs> like whenever we're like doing stuff that's hot, there's a ton of attention. And then if it's not so controversial, sometimes people aren't as interested, but we like to just have great content. And so we're just thrilled you're here. Yeah. So if you had to summarize what is, you've kind of said it, but like if you had to give like the elevator pitch of what is nearest and dearest to your heart, of what fuels you, of what you're most passionate about, how would you describe that like in a sentence or two? Like your mission, well, like your your why. You well, know? the that's really the start of what I plan to okay, talk good. about here in this good. interview. So when as as I was examining this relationship between Native Americans and the Book of Mormon, what really ate at me is the absence of native voices in the discussion. Uh, in that it most of what you read about the Book of Mormon uh, is frankly white men talking about native people uh, without engaging them in the conversation. And that is a form of erasure. And it just, I, I think for me, I, it, was a, it was a personal thing, but it was also one, a way of doubting my own voice was a, a part of this as well. Because even though I was raised with these stories of having a Lamanite ancestor, I knew I was raised white. I knew that 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 was my. I was. We were supposed to be. We were the. We were supposed to have over time become white and delightsome, and that was the expectation. Uh, and in in essence, my own ancestry was erased uh, in those stories. Although we did hold it with a certain amount of pride, you know that oh, we have this connection. When we're reading when we're reading the Book of Mormon, we understood it as we're reading the story of our ancestors. Sorry to interrupt, but. I, I think I found it fascinating reading one of your articles where you talked about how you saw on your family the prophecy of the Book of Mormon of your family becoming white and lightsome as being fulfilled. 
And can you talk a little bit about just what that prophecy is? What What's that understanding that your family had as a Mormon and that many Mormons probably still have yeah. uh, about white and the light, some skin versus darker skin? And can you just explain a little bit about that? Yeah, the, the Book of Mormon version that I grew up reading uh, predicted that uh, in it, upon adopting the the gospel uh, that uh, descendants of the lamanites would one day become white and delightsome i uh, and that would be changed in 1981 uh, and very noticeably changed so it was a very much a topic of discussion in our family as well as at, at church and in seminary at that time i uh, and you know it was changed to pure and delightsome right I, and but we had you know grown up that this was we were expected to become white uh, and there's this narrative in in the the book of mormon where a dark skin is seen as a curse from god for wickedness mm -hmm. and that when uh the lamanites who were supposed to be the ancestors of the american indians would convert uh to christianity uh, they would become white right Uh, and the idea was that, as I learned it from my my parents, uh, was that you know our ancestors had uh, eventually joined the church, uh, and you know it was intermarriage was acknowledged, uh, but there was also that aspect that the church had helped to turn us uh, into that that ge a generation of white and delightsome. Right. And Spencer Kimball and several other modern prophets would be talking about this in, you know, like general conferences and, and talks, right? Like about how this prophecy of Native Americans becoming white and delightsome through their posterity was becoming true. Is that, is that in, right? Indeed, that's the opening quote for my dissertation is from that, that talk. I think it was in 1961, if I remember right, that Spencer Kimball uh, talked about... Uh, <coughs> the placement program uh the indian placement program yeah. that it took native children from uh the reservation communities and placed them into more white mormon homes uh and he contended that uh, that children were actually turning white through that process now of course going from working outside to coming inside homes uh and you know that probably did affect the the degree the, the some of the the skin tone uh, of individuals right. uh, and he had pictures to to prove it you know uh, and i uh, that that quote you know opens the dissertation because it's particularly problematic right uh, it, it's so easy to see it today as racist uh, and it took me a while in in my own growth and development to start to recognize the racist implications of that but as i recognize the racist implications of that idea that we would turn white and delightsome i also began to question whose story is this to tell because dna had already shown that uh, native americans are not connected to israel and so that uh, the book of mormon is not a native story it's right. not an indigenous story uh, and that in fact when my state president confronted me over this my statement of saying that that this is not an uh, authentic indigenous account that was what really really kind of uh i think drew his irritation uh, and for me personally it was also problematic okay so uh, if there aren't really Lamanites, anciently at least, what about people who have been raised, like I was, to believe these stories? Uh, and so, who is a Lamanite? Uh, and that becomes a central part of, of, the, of my dissertation, is how have Native Mormons understood this? And th this was... Uh, really, the, the the first dissertation to take seriously uh, native voices uh, in the discussion, uh, and it it was some work to track down uh, native voices through my own ethnographic work in in Nahua communities, uh, through uh, digging through back issues of dialogue and sunstone and and places like that, trying to find uh, those references, uh, digging through 
uh, records from Indian placement programs and interviews from kids and stories of kids uh, in those programs. Those become the places that uh, I drew uh, indigenous voices uh, into the narrative. The other place I turned was indigenous scholarship. Uh, one of the most influential scholars at the time for me was Vine Deloria Jr., a Dakota uh, scholar who really challenged the field of anthropology uh, as well as uh, uh, bringing to light the importance of Native people telling their own stories. Mm. Uh, and <laughs> that produced a bit of a crisis of conscience for me because what what right even do I have to tell the story? Uh, and I did have some connection, but I knew that my voice lacked some auth authenticity as well. And so I wanted to elevate uh, indigenous voices. I, and, you know, for me, that issue, I felt like, well, I had gathered what I could could find at the time and tried to shift the focus to indigenous voices. And I thought that was really a time for me to start to step back. Uh, and it helped that uh, there was a, a scholar, he was a student at the University of Washington when I was a, a, a PhD student. He was an undergrad and then a, a graduate student in the Native Voices program. This, his name is Angelo Baca, he's Hopi and, and Navajo. And he kind of took, uh, we had a lot of discussions. He took my dissertation research and uh, retold it in, in his own voice uh, and in you know, bringing in his own story and that of other Native Mormons in a, a film that I helped him produ produce called In Layman's Terms. And this film begins with a basic premise, who is a Lamanite? Uh, but again, unlike any previous work, the focus was on indigenous answers to that question. And so he in, interviews a number of Native Mormons, a number of Native people who are not Mormon, but who had, in, had encounters and engagements with Mormonism, and a number of leading scholars, uh, such as Havanani K. Trask or Forrest Kutch, uh, and these these voices start to tell in layman's terms uh, what is Lamanite <laughs> identity. Uh, and so I really kind of felt optimistic at the time that that if I step back and that I didn't I didn't need to be the voice, you know, that I could I could fade into the background, if you will, uh, in uh, Lamanite studies. And uh, at the same time, I had other things happening that were quite significant in my life. I had taken a job at Edmonds Community College shortly before, a few years before I'd finished my dissertation. And I particularly chose the community college. Well, for one, it was it's a tough job market, uh, and there weren't a lot of job opportunities, even for PhDs, just like now. Uh, and so it, I was fortunate to get that job. But... I was attracted to applying to a community college because of its social justice components that I felt like at a, at a community college, I could, I could make a greater impact on, on people's lives. I could have, I could live the social justice dream, if you will, in that uh, I could be in the trenches, uh, really helping people who were, disenfranchised in life. Because when you look at the statistics of who goes to a community college versus who goes to a university, particularly in the state of Washington, because it, it varies across the country, but in the state of Washington, the biggest predictor of who uh, goes to a community college versus who goes to a university is income. It's economics. It's not ability. Uh, and so hmm. I had the opportunity to work with really gifted and talented students who through choices or things that are through no fault that, of their own. Yeah. No fault of their own. You yeah. got the word that yeah. I was trying to come <laughs> up with. Uh, is it through no fault of their own? They were able to, or, or they didn't have the option of going to the university of Washington. Uh, and yet by spending a couple of years with me, 
we could get them to the place where they could uh, or other places. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, so it was a really a great opportunity to make transformative impact on people's lives. And in the, the first year after I got my full-time position, uh, which was in 2000, uh, I'd been part-time at, at Edmonds for a couple of years before that. But in that first year after my full-time position began, and this has happened simultaneously with my work on the, the dissertation, because uh, the dissertation was completed in 2003. And I was invited by the Native Student Association to be the advisor for the, the Native American uh, Student Association. And that was a, a deep honor uh, to, to be asked. And it really gave me a chance to work closely with the Native students on campus that would really come to define my career. Uh, and, but it wasn't a great start. Uh, what they, what the students wanted to do was actually really ambitious. They wanted to uh, put on a powwow that involved a, a powwow is a, a sharing of, of traditions of, of song and dance and arts and crafts uh, with the larger community. But uh, also most of the participants are, are, are native. Most of the audience even are native, but then it's sharing with the larger audience and particularly bringing to campus uh, a support network for the native students on campus. So bringing their family and their friends. Utah state actually does one of these every year. Mm -hmm. So I, I've seen it. Yeah. I've seen a little bit. It's quite incredible. So Edmonds had, before I arrived, had this really fortunate history of having been the host institution for Indian Heritage High School, which was in the Seattle School District. They didn't have a facility large enough to host their pow powwow. And so they'd partnered with Edmonds College, or Edmonds Community College, uh, for over a decade before I arrived uh, on hosting their powwow. But the principal of that school, Robert Eaglestaff, had passed away, and he'd been kind of the connection. And the person that it, whose job I'd taken, his name is uh, Dale Crows, he had gone on to South Puget Sound Community College. And so that, that relationship between Indian Heritage High School, Edmonds College, was, was kind of uh, going away, and eventually Indian Heritage High School was closed. Uh, so I ended up kind of in this fortunate place where there was a strong need uh, for somebody in the anthropology department to step into that role. And so I, I stepped into that role and uh, became the advisor. They also wanted, in addition to that, they wanted to bring uh, Sherman Alexi, who was a very prominent uh, Spokane uh, artist. Spokane is the nation from which he comes uh, in, also from what, in, in Washington State. And he'd spoken to some of my classes I'd previously taught at the University of Washington, and, and I, one of my colleagues there was a good friend of his. So I helped them uh, negotiate that, but you know, in order to do in order to do those two things, the students had to raise over fifty thousand dollars in a year to to be able to put on these this types of pro, this type of program, uh, and so that was very ambitious. And I wasn't sure they could do it, but they did it, and I helped a little, but they did it. Uh, and by the end of the year, it was kind of exhilarating to have having pulled all this this <laughs> off. I uh, but it was there were also some tensions that had started growing within the within the club, uh, particularly between the men and the women in the club. And, uh, you know, in Native cultures are very diverse. And so you have some cultures that are more patrilineal and some that are more matrilineal. Mm. Uh, and so patrilineal would be when the you're, you trace your lineage through your father's line. Yeah. Matrilineal, you trace your lineage through your mother's line. Uh, and so women have different levels of involvement within the community in that. In matrilineal societies, women tend to have more leadership roles mm -hmm. uh, because your, your mother's lineage is, is your key connection. Uh, and and at, at, a, at a college that brings students from a lot of different places, we had a lot of Alaska Native students that were very matrilineal, but we then had some Plains, Plains Native students that had more of a patrilineal heritage. And, and so there were tensions. Uh, and in those tensions, uh, I insisted that the women have a voice. 
uh, and stood up to the male uh, leaders of the club. Uh, and their response was uh, that they didn't need me as an advisor. <laughs> uh, and uh, that it was, this was actually really a trying moment for me. And a moment then when I look back on, I regret the decision that I made, but I, I really had a, an element of white privilege and I'm like, you don't need me. I don't need you. And so I resigned and, uh, I thought, you know, I don't, there, there's so many other things I can do within the anthropology department. I don't need to be defined by my relationship with the native student association. And well, Powell they, might not get you yeah. tenure. You know what I mean? Yeah. And <laughs> you know, it was an immature and, uh, uh, a short-sighted response to, to challenge. I, uh, and it took me a while to realize that, but there were two, two women in particular that played a key role in changing, uh, my perspective. Uh, and uh, I'll mention their names because I do have I do have their permission to tell this story. I have published this story actually in an in an article uh, called "No One Asked for an Ethnography" in the Journal of uh, Northwest Anthropology. Uh, and these these two women, Joey and Sherakita, who were intriguingly Blackfeet, uh, which is a Plains tribe, and uh, Tlingit, which is an Alaska Native tribe. So they were kind of uh in between those matrilineal patrilineal uh cultures but even in their blackfoot blackfeet heritage uh they they were relations with eloise cobell who is one of the great warriors of native uh civil rights in the 21st century uh and she uh, sued the united states government uh for mishandling native uh banking and funds uh, and received the largest settlement in the history of the United States uh, for uh, mismanagement of funds. Mm. Uh, and so even on their Blackfeet side, they had this really great uh, role model uh, as a woman. Yeah. And what I learned from Joey and Cher was that they didn't have the white privilege that I had, that they couldn't, they couldn't walk away. It was who they were. And they kept asking me to come back. And I'm like, no, I'm not going to do that. And then I said, okay, I'll do it, but I'll do it behind the scenes. I won't be an advisor, <laughs> but I'll help you. Okay. And so then I would, I would help and I helped them put on the next powwow. But I did it. I was entirely in the back room. You know, I was hardly show, showed my face in, in public. Uh, and I watched the way that those two women worked just incredulously. And I mean, it brought me to tears. Uh, and I like, before the night was over, I just said, I'll be your advisor. You inspired me. Uh, and that experience, even though I made mistakes at that time, that would... I, I would come back to that experience many times over the years uh, because working in native communities is not, uh, it's not a romantic experience. Okay. There's this, there are these ideas of, uh, especially when you look at native religion and philosophy and spirituality, there, there are these really grand ideas and important teachings uh, that 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 are easy to romanticize okay and to see uh, natives as the natural guardians of the earth or you know to to see that sort of thing but the reality of native experience in the united states is but is that indigenous people have been colonized uh, their children have been taken from their homes and placed into boarding schools into Mormon homes as well. Uh, and they've been beaten for speaking their own languages. Uh, they've, uh, you know, the reason, the reason that uh, 
the United States government took Native children out of uh, their homes as they wanted to break the relationship between parents and children. And so they put children into boarding schools in order to, uh, to prevent the parents from teaching uh, the traditions, yeah. from teaching the language. Uh, and here were Mormons doing the same thing, taking Native children from Mormon homes. But we viewed it, we viewed it as Mormons in that we're helping lift them out of poverty, okay? But we were doing the same abusive practices that the U.S. government was doing, but we didn't recognize them. Well, yeah, we actually used, if you read the, the stories of... of uh, Mormon or white Mormon families that that took in native children, they would use the the boarding schools as an excuse. It was like, oh well, there, it's better better to come into a Mormon home than come into a boarding school, okay? Uh, it, but the reality was that Mormons were doing the same thing. They were breaking the connection between the families, between the parents and the children, uh, and teaching a new tradition that would erase the past uh, and the so in working in native communities there's trauma there's real trauma uh, and there's healing and i encountered trauma again and again and again uh, but in learning from Joey and Cher, I was able to to step back, you know, and not react in a self-defensive way, not to react as that white privileged male uh, and and use that white privilege to step away from the trauma. I faced the trauma, uh, lived it with them in order that we could heal together. Yeah. It's inspiring. <clears throat> the, go Something ahead. that just came to my mind as you're talking about that is um, this ideas of, of taking away people's culture. Um, I mean, I've heard, I, I grew up hearing the stories from a young age of my parents serving missions in Oaxaca. Mm -hmm. And going to you know this native families and teaching them mormonism and teaching them how their traditions were wrong yeah. their traditions about um celebrating the day of the dead and the way they celebrated it and how they needed to embrace mormon culture and le leave their native and you know, Mexican and native cultures. Um, and it's still so prevalent to the point where like, it reminds me to the year 2020 when other Quint, Quint L. L. Cook, mm -hmm. I don't know if you've heard about this talk in general conference where he talked about how the culture of the church or the culture that the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints um, teaches is the only one true culture. Mm -hmm. um and it yeah like you said it, there's this trauma of the church coming and colonizing um this this cultures um that have been there for you know centuries and 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 trying to impose anglo-saxon culture yeah, and the idea that there's this one true culture or one true religion is yeah. is a form of re erasure, right? You know, and by replacing indigenous stories with the Book of Mormon, uh, we participate in uh, that act of colonization. Yeah, you know, in that work with the the powwow, as I came back into to working with with the powwow at Edmonds Community College, uh, I began then to say, okay, how can I start to bring the resources of the, the college uh, in order to help better help and support Native students? 
And so I started using my white privilege in a different way. Instead of using it to run away from trauma, uh, I used it to uh, fix, uh, to try to uh, counteract, uh, to try to uh, basically decolonize uh, the community college system. Uh, and uh, some examples of, of the, the, the work that I did there is that I had asked the college to begin supporting, uh, pr provide some support for, for me as part of my workload to work with the Native students. And initially, they declined the request. But then the vice president, a year later, came back to me and said, uh, you know how you asked for support for the Native students? Well, what about if, if you did it within the context of service learning? Uh, and would you be willing to help lead the development of a service learning program for the college? Uh, and I actually hadn't heard the term service learning before that. Uh, and I started researching it and uh, discovered I'd been doing it all along. And that <laughs> the, the, the vice president had recognized that I was doing service learning, even though I had not heard the term. But basically, service learning is a, a, a teaching methodology where you combine service objectives with learning objectives. Mm -hmm. And so that you work with community partners in order to identify needs within the community. And then you look for ways that those needs can be met uh, through the involvement of students in the process mm -hmm. uh, that, that can kind of combine those learning and service objectives. Uh, and by putting on a powwow and involving students in that process, which I had al already been doing, that is a form of service learning. Yeah. Because the student, the non-native students that are coming in and helping, as well as the native students who were doing it, uh, they were learning about native cultures in a hands-on way. They would learn it. It was not, the, as I said, it wasn't the romanticized version. Uh, it was the down in the dirt, uh, nitty and gritty. Uh, hard work of uh, putting on a cultural event within a, a colonized institution. And so it was really powerful learning experiences. Uh, and more importantly than the, the content that students would learn was the relationships that students would build. Uh, and so non-native students working together side by side with the native students built some relationships that uh, are, were deeply impactful. Uh, and for me and for my wife, Carrie, uh, who uh, eventually got a job at Edmonds College as well and, and helped uh, in this, this process, she uh, in fact would become an advisor, co-advisor, and for some years the advisor of the club herself. Uh, and play even bigger role than me in continuing this powwow tradition. Well, we, with this responsibility of, of doing service learning was just kind of a great match and that would uh, become part of my legacy over the next uh, 20 years at the college is developing this, this way of learning. And there were, uh, The, one, of the, one of the biggest uh, developments in, in building our service learning program was a program that I, I built called the Learn and Serve Environmental Anthropology Field School. And I want to take a little aside here uh, to kind of go back in time to explain my inspiration for what we would call the LEAF School, the Learn and Serve Environmental Anthropology, Anthropology Field School. The inspiration for that was actually work I did in Oaxaca. Uh, oh. This was, I was there in uh, 97, 98. I don't know, when were your parents there? Um, 90, 92. 92, perhaps. so a little mm -hmm. bit before me. Okay. So I want to kind of go back to Oaxaca and tell that story because I think for this, this Mormon Stories audience, the work I was doing in Oaxaca that would inspire the Leaf School has important implications for the Book of Mormon as well. And so as part of my graduate studies at the University of Washington, one of my college professors, uh, Dr. Eugene Hun, as a linguistic anthropologist, uh, was looking for research assistants to help with this, what was called the Zapotec Ethnobiology Project. Uh, Zapotec is an indigenous people in uh, Oaxaca. Uh, and I should point out that for those that believe the Book of Mormon occurred in Mesoamerica, 
uh, Oaxaca is kind of at the heart of uh, John Sorensen's uh, limited Tuantepec geography for the Book of Mormon. Uh, so unrelated to Mormon studies, I had this incredible opportunity to uh, participate in a, a deep ethnographic project with the Zapotec people. When and, you were there, were you would you be familiarized with John Sorensen's work and what he was saying about you know, limited geography of Book of Mormon? Yes, I was. I was aware of it, uh, but that wasn't my primary research right, question. Right. Uh, but I would do other. I would do research questions that were very, that had implications for his model. Yeah. Uh, and so our real research objective that we were working on is that uh, <laughs> Dr. Hunt had been invited by uh, some environmental organizations in Oaxaca City uh, to help document uh, the flora and fauna, or the plants and animals of a region of the, uh, the uh, Sierra, uh, Sierra Sur uh, Mountains in uh, Oaxaca that had not been documented previously by scientists. Okay, so the knowing what which plants and animals were there, and, and particularly the relationship between people and the plants and animals, mm -hmm. uh, this is what uh, the organization that that he was nonprofit organization that had invited him down there uh, was really interested in developing, and so uh, he had gone uh, in in a previous year to uh, these highland communities uh, to see if there was interest on their part of having uh, this research done. And uh, I got to participate in one of those, uh, a, a second trip uh, where we secured the permission of the community to do the work. Uh, and it, that was an important part of the, anth the anthropology is we're gonna come in, we're gonna help study and document plants and animals. Uh, it, but we gave them a chance, what do you want out of this? If we're, if we're gonna come and spend this time, what do you want? from us uh, and to, to build a re reciprocal relation. And actually what they asked for uh, from us was uh, challenging because what, what they asked for, and, and this is, you know, keep, keep in mind that we're kind of, we're this team of anthropologists working, we're, we're environmentalists. We're very conscientious about, uh, chemicals and the application of chemicals and we we're coming to learn traditional agricultural methods okay uh, and what they asked for our help in return was that they wanted to get access to some pesticides that they could use on their peaches mm. and here we are coming to study traditional agriculture and <laughs> traditional methods uh, and it was a compromise we did help them get what they wanted uh, and uh, in return we uh, got to have, you know, what would really be a, a decade long uh, research project. I would only participate in that first year, uh, but the decade long research project, looking at Zapotec uh, understandings of the natural world. Uh, and for us kind of on a, on a, a deeper anthropological level, there were kind of questions about how the human mind operates. Uh, and so we were interested in, as part of a larger body of research, understanding how do humans categorize the natural world? Are there patterns uh, across cultures? Because actually they'd been already been observed across cultures that humans have similar categories for birds and mammals or uh, fish. Uh, these sort of categories appear to be rather cross-cultural. Uh, and so we're interested in kind of how, how the, the mind operates cognitively uh, in categorizing uh, what we observe. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of our, our research was around that and, you know, looking at language and its relationship to animals. Well, that actually had some surprising applications for the Book of Mormon, uh, looking at John Sorensen. Because if, if you understand kind of the history of what, what John Sorensen was uh, responding to in developing a limited geography in Mesoamerica is he was responding to some anachronisms in the Book of Mormon. He was responding to uh, the wrong plants and animals. For people who don't know who John Sorensen is, could you yeah. give us just a brief description of who sure. he is and and why he 
because John Sorensen is a really interesting story. Yeah. Uh, especially because the brethren at the time were not very looking at his work with very kind eyes because they were wanting to look at the Book of Mormon in a different way that John Sorensen. Can, can you just talk about a, a little bit about and that? We need we need a full episode just on, dedicated on John to John Sorensen. Sorensen. Yeah. In fact, there was a a journalist back east who did like a article on John yes. Sorensen in a in a really respectable journal. I've been in touch with her. We need to follow up on that because it would be great. Maybe even yeah. have you be a part of that. But. Yeah, well, I, I'm familiar with the article. I don't remember the yeah the, the title. But it's I, an important yeah, story. I, I consulted it. Yeah, yeah. I but, mean, what well, I remember from the article really, really <laughs> critically is that uh, he never really asked the question if the Book of Mormon was true or not. Mm -hmm. uh, it, he assumed it was true from the beginning, <laughs> uh, and then went. Apologies tend to work that yeah. way, <laughs> and went from that 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 perspective. Uh, and as I read read his work, it, what really what struck me was that wow, he's come up with a clever way to do anthropology at BYU, mm. uh, because really anthropology and the Book of Mormon are just on one level seem really incompatible. Yeah, because anthropology undermines uh, the truth claims of the Book of Mormon in a fundamental way, uh, and so the anachronisms are a big part of that the wrong plants and animals uh are part of those anachronisms the wrong uh technology uh, and so i want to focus here on just the the, the plants and animals uh oh i didn't really answer your question yeah, though about yeah, john john sorensen. john sorensen was a <laughs> uh so he was a professor of anthropology at, at brigham young university okay uh, and in he was you know basically wrestling with how to do anthropology at BYU, <laughs> and uh, comes up with this this clever way of kind of reinterpreting the Book of Mormon, mm. uh, so that uh, so that he could do anthropology there without it being quite as controversial. And it's kind of the basic uh, premise that that he he develops is one that the Book of Mormon is not a story of all of the Americas. Okay. Uh, that is, in fact, uh, a limited uh, story of a small group of people uh, that came came to the Americas. And he actually uses the Popol Vuh that we're going to talk about later uh, as kind of a model of a lineage history of a small group of people uh, that migrate uh, to a new region and uh, have an impact just within that limited locality. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that... Because before him, people would be seeing the Book of Mormon as something that happened all across America, Native Americans, all every everywhere. That's why the Book of Mormon would say that the Lamanites are the principal um, ancestors of of the Native Americans, because it was yeah. it was the whole Americans. And then, but but then because there's a lot of problems with that, you know, because of the type of stuff that the Book of Mormon mentions. Um, then he he came up with this idea of maybe this story of the Book of Mormon happening this little part where we kind of have to find where he happened. Yeah, and uh, we'll get a little bit more into this a little bit later when we talk about the Popo Woos. But uh, it really this idea is not original to John Swanson. There's a history of ideas that go back uh, to several other thinkers, and especially to Lewis Hill, who was a scholar with the reorganized uh, church of jesus christ of latter-day mm, saints now yep. the community of christ and so he was writing in the 1910s uh and first developed this idea of a more of a limited geographic setting uh and and he was focusing on on the the popol vu as a model as well mm -hmm. and so this this model responds to several challenges in the Book of Mormon. Is in that the Book of Mormon, the distances traveled, uh, and the days it took to travel, the distances are just not in, not really compatible with a hemispheric geography. Right, uh, and so it it is. It's not realistic that people could have been spread across uh, North and South America, mm -hmm. uh, and have this this tale be covering the the whole, the whole. Uh, two hemispheres yet at the same time it makes it appear as if that's what's happening there's this narrow passage of land you got the land northward the land yeah. southward yeah. it just it when you read it it sounds like north and south america and that's how mormons interpret it through uh most actually until the dna research really i mean john Sorensen was paving the way 
but the church would not really officially adopt it. In fact, their response to John Sorensen and others like uh, Thomas Stuart Ferguson and uh, Milton Hunter and stuff that were arguing for uh, this limited geography, their response was in 1981 to put into the introduction of the Book of Mormon that the Lamanites are the principal ancestors of the American Indians. Yeah. And so not only uh, were they were uh, somewhat resistant, they made the church official policy hmm. against Sorensen. Now, I think there were struggles within the leadership, right? And I, I, just like we see today, I think there's different opinions within the church leadership. And so Sorensen's work in his angles, he eventually gets his ideas uh, published in the Ensign yeah. magazine. And there are stories of like Marky yeah. Peterson or Bruce McConkie, like getting Sorensen's papers, like yeah. uh, because he would submit them to be published on, on church uh, magazines. And then they would say, no, we're not going to publish it put it away and then it was until years later where it finally like you're talking you finally came out on the ensign which yeah is and if i remember i think that was 1985 i think if i remember right mm -hmm. but you know it was a it, it was a significant event to get that uh publication but it was an internal struggle right it was an internal struggle i uh, and i a key component of his model is to deal with the wrong plants and animals. What he proposed is that when, when people in, when in a colonial context, when a new group of people comes into an area and they encounter uh, new animals, that there will be cross-cultural naming practices where you will see misnomers, okay? Say, uh, you know, the people encountering uh, buffalo uh, on the plains might call them cows mm. or cattle, okay? Uh, but they're a different species, but they're kind of similar, right? Uh, or uh, these, the these taper, sort of, Is this where the yeah. taper idea would be? Yeah, the tapir, that's kind of the, the, the kind of famous one, the tapir is yeah. the horse. And, and that, you know, I, that... Uh, trying to track down the the roots of that actual one it he doesn't say it directly that way and so people take it they exaggerate what Sorensen's saying yeah but that's kind of a dramatic way of of, yeah. of exaggerating what Sorensen is saying is to say that a horse is a tapir uh or a deer yeah okay? that's kind of that misnomer deer is when you actually read what he wrote uh is the specific example but tapir is a logical implication of that way of thinking uh and but so I, but i grew yeah. up in mexico with that apologetic argument that like really believing it that mm -hmm. that maybe joseph was seeing deer or tapers and then but he wrote horses in the book yeah. of mormon yeah because in mexico like we're studying like in high school we're studying um you know like the real Plants and animals. Uh, plants and animals that existed in Mexico. <laughs> so then I had these questions to to my to my dad, right? Like, yeah. what 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 is this about? And that was his like my dad would have the farms and John Sorensen's book mm -hmm. books um about you know all these ideas. Yeah. And you know, it it's a clever way. It's a clever way to explain away the wrong plants and animals. Yeah. I uh, but ironically or fortuitously. Uh, this research project I participated in in Zapotec country gave us a gave me a direct opportunity to test Sorensen's proposal. Okay, uh, and can we see that his idea of misnomers uh, are they occurring in Zapotec communities? Uh, when did these uh, non-native plants and animals get introduced? And let me point out a, an important critique of Sorensen uh, before I go into the what we learned in the Zapotec community, and that is what what Sorensen conveniently ignores in the Book of Mormon is that uh, the Book of Mormon says the Jaredites brought over the plants, animals, and seeds from mm -hmm. uh, from the, uh, the the ancient Near East uh, to the New World. Uh, and uh, so when the Nephites come, they encounter the 
animals and plants that the <laughs> Jaredites had encountered and brought more of their own as well. Yeah. Uh, that they brought with them. And so uh, Sorensen conveniently ignores that. Okay. Uh, but that was one question we could test as well. So we could, we could test these basic ideas. When did the sheep, cattle, goats, horses, etc., get introduced into Zapotec communities? Right. And then what were the naming practices that were used? Uh, and what we found is that uh, the names for uh, plant animals and, and plants such as uh, a horse. Okay. And I'll give you an example there. Well, what, what I'll say in general is that we found clear evidence that the names for European derived plants and animals uh, emerged uh, in the 16th century from Spanish. Okay. So we have a documentary record in terms of dictionaries uh, done by Spanish missionaries uh, as well as the, the, the linguistic evidence in uh, the terms themselves that we can pinpoint when these plants and animals were introduced. Okay. So European plants and animals were clearly introduced in the 16th century, not in ancient America. Mm -hmm. So they did the plants and animals there did not come across with the Jaredites or the Nephites. Uh, and the evidence, linguistic evidence for that is in the naming system. So the name for uh, a horse in, in Zapotec is Kabai, uh, which is... <laughs> that sounds a little Spanish. <laughs> yeah, those who speak Spanish, yeah, where did that come from? From Caballo, Caballo right? Uh, so uh, very obvious borrowing uh, of terms. Uh, and That's the so Zapotec funny. word for donkey is burro. <laughs> what does that say what is what burro. is donkey in, yeah <laughs> donkey in spanish is burro uh so it really becomes clear that these are borrowings from spanish okay and not some ancient knowledge of uh, european plants and animals in that region uh and but there is a interesting misnomer like john Sorensen talks about uh and this is with sheep uh, so sheep are called uh, what that. translates into English as cotton dogs or mekwi shiu, uh, which I probably mispronounced there, but that was my attempt. Uh, but the with cotton dogs, uh, there is a misnomer. Okay, uh, so sheep are seen similar to dogs. Now, dogs. It's important to note in a lot of Native American cultures uh, were raised for their uh, fur and so that there were dogs whose fur was used in weaving in native traditions all the way up to the pacific northwest where 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 i live mm. uh, and i uh, so to call a, a sheep a cotton dog is a sense of a misnomer right uh however what would what, what sorensen would would yeah. be claiming right like yeah. they're seeing something that looks kind of like what something that they would know about and mm -hmm. they would name it yeah and so they you'd see a a, a, a sheep uh, and associate it with a dog which is familiar potential source of fur uh and uh and a, a, a crop cotton cotton is is native both to the americas and to the old world and right. domesticated independently in both yeah uh and so it's is is kind of a a way of making a logical connection. Yeah. Uh, the problem, though, with Sorensen's argument is that the Zapotec are not confused about dogs and sheep. Okay. <laughs> they we, when we're there, they know which one is the dog and which one is the sheep. Right. Okay. Uh, and so it 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 doesn't his logic doesn't follow through to that next step. Uh, so the proper translation. If you're Joseph Smith translating this term from Zapotec, your proper translation would still be sheep. Right. And, and it wouldn't be dog. Uh, or, you know, if, if you were going to go that more literal translation, it would be cotton dog. Right. Okay. And so we don't see uh, cotton dog in the Book of Mormon. We see okay? sheep. Yeah. Yeah. And with the tight translation, which, yeah. which, because of the Book of Mormon witnesses, we know 
that the claim was that Joseph was reading off a stone word for word. Yeah. We, the, the whole loose translation theory just is not tenable. Yeah. And, you know, I, I think it's not just the misnomer, but really where Sorensen's logic falls apart is in that, that translation process. It doesn't right. change that it's still the best English translation uh, is, is, is not the misnomer. Okay. It's what the actual animal is. Uh, but on a grander scale, what Sorensen really misses is that uh, the occasional use of familiar names for unfamiliar animals doesn't cause them to disappear from cultural knowledge or the archaeological record. And the behavior of the animal doesn't change when cross-cultural naming practices are used. Mm. Uh, and what Sorensen does is, is ignore in kind of an ethnocentric or kind of a biased way, the Zapotec's deep engagement with and knowledge of the natural world, what we would call in our research to traditional environmental knowledge. It's not that uh, horses uh, or oxen or sheep or goats, they don't occur independently of, of relationships with people relationship with other plants and animals a an oxen is literally tied to a plow okay uh, and so when you see an oxen you also have a plow because that's the cultural work that a domesticated oxen is doing right okay uh, and so if in uh, zapotec culture we do not uh, traditionally uh, in ancient America, there were no plows, okay? Uh, and so there was no plow-based agriculture. Mm. Uh, and so these, even even if he was correct on this is an excuse for a misnomer, it doesn't change the whole culture. Yeah. Uh, and cultures and ecology are deeply intertwined. Uh, so, I mean, if you if you look at the Book of Mormon, the Book of Mormon is an, is a, a portrait of a pastoral culture okay uh, and what i mean by pastoral is this is a culture that's deeply engaged in the racing of domestic animals right uh even the metaphors that the book of mormon uses for jesus christ are pastoral metaphors mm -hmm. sheep and shepherd okay these are people who are <laughs> ingrained within a particular type of culture yeah and this is a type of culture that does not exist in ancient America. Uh, a, it, yeah. Just because I grew up also with this idea that yes, maybe it was not horses, maybe it was uh, deers and tapers. Mm -hmm. And then, but then this idea that, well, the Book of Mormon don't, doesn't really say that horses were like people were, you know, like riding horses. It does, like the Book of Mormon doesn't say that. So then that's why we can assume that maybe it's something else. Um, but, but like you're saying, if Joseph would have been seeing, you know, like a deer, why would he call it horse if he was not being employed for what a horse is employed? For? Right. But there are chariots in the right. Book of Mormon, right? right? And it's, the chariots pull themselves. <laughs> but or there's, what, the, you know, Daniel Peterson says that, well, there's chariots and there's horses, but it doesn't say that, that the horses say were explicitly. pulling the <laughs> Right. Yeah. And I mean, again, that's, that's. <laughs> the, the logic falls apart. Yeah. Uh, and my point is having worked in uh, deeply in these in, indigenous Zapotec communities, that's exactly what we were studying is the intimate knowledge of the natural world and right. the interconnection between plants, animals, and people. And that deep interconnection uh, can't be just lifted out and say, oh, this is a misnomer and this is a misnomer. There's a cultural system to the Book of Mormon. And that cultural system reflects 19th century America, which we're going to get to later. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, and so that was a little aside to tell, come back to my story. But this work in a Zapotec community uh, would have a profound impact on the trajectory of my career at Edmonds because of a, of a young girl. Her name was Mar Maria Elena Cruz Hernandez. Uh, and she was a 10 year old girl, the same age as my daughter when I was doing research there. Uh, and this little girl 
was our biggest helper. I, she would, we were collecting like uh, arthropods or insects. We were collecting different types of insects. We were collecting uh, plants and animal specimens, learning the names of them. Uh, and she was our most valuable collector of insects. She knew all these different types of insects, mm -hmm. where to find them. She knew their names in Spanish and in Zapotec. She knew where to find all sorts of different plants and what, and what these plants would be used for. Uh, and uh, likewise, the animals and their names and where did where do the animals live? What kind of footprints does this this animal leave? And how does that tell you where that animal is? Uh, here's this 10 year old girl who has a knowledge of the natural world that's superior to mine as an adult scientist visiting her community. And it's like it was awe inspiring for us. Uh, and uh, we did uh, these studies to try to figure out, is Mari Elena just an exception? Is she like just a particularly <laughs> brilliant child? Uh, or is this type of knowledge widespread in the community? And so uh, we did these uh, tests of basically testing kids on their knowledge. And uh, what we found is that she was smart. You know, she was definitely a, a smart kid, but she wasn't, that different from her peers. Uh, and that Zapotec children acquired a scientific knowledge of the natural world uh, in their everyday activities. And they were uh, attaining this, what we would call an ethnoscience, uh, not through school, although the, in this community, even though it was remote, uh, they did attend public schools uh, where they learned in Spanish, but they didn't learn any of this in Spanish because we were collecting the Zapotec knowledge, mm -hmm. okay? And they knew the Zapotec knowledge even better than the Spanish. Uh, and I, so they gained this intimate knowledge of the natural world through helping collect plants and animals for her grandmother. Maria Elena was, would help her grandmother get whatever plant she needed. She said, I need, I need this for whatever uh, medicinal practice they're working on or whatever food they're preparing. Uh, and would send her out to to go collect it. And uh, we would work with them going out to the milpas or the farms and these little mini farms and and helping them raise the raise the crops. and and they're, as we're going back and forth, they're collecting the things along the way of what they're going to need for dinner that night or the next day. and uh, and that was her job. And she was just learning this. It was also embedded deeply in the stories that were being told, the stories that, they learned, and, and the Day of the Dead practices were a huge part of it because uh, those Day of the Dead practices involved collecting all these different flowers. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, those flowers would be used uh, not just in Day of the Dead ceremonies, but in ceremonies that continued throughout the year, the, the fiestas and the, the saints' days and stuff that uh, would involve the use of flowers. And so you need to know what flowers in season, where it's going to be found, what's the name of it. Uh, and and that was all integrated into the religious practices and into uh, that everyday life. Uh, and so I was just awe-inspired that a child the age of my own daughter could develop that kind of intimate knowledge of the natural world, and I envied it. I wanted that for myself. I wanted that. I wanted to be able to give that to my daughter. And I and I you know I grew up as a Boy Scout. I was actually quite involved in learning plants and animals. And I'd loved doing it as a Boy Scout. I, I remember winning the, they call it the Bigfoot Award for uh, being able to identify the most plants and animals <laughs> and animal tracks. Uh, and so I thought I, I thought I knew something, but when I confronted this 10 year old girl, whose knowledge was just head and shoulders above my own, I was like, how do I do that in my own life? Uh, and I thought, well, you know, I could use this service learning uh, opportunities at Edmonds to try to do that sort of thing. So I, I started talking to uh, the Coast Salish tribes that I was already working with on the powwow and stuff and saying, you know, are there environmental projects that we could work on that use traditional environmental or ecological knowledge uh, and apply it to addressing real problems in the world today? What are your needs, basically, is what I was asking, that where students could help to acquire that intimate knowledge of their local environment 
and help you with projects in Western Washington. And that really was kind of the, the inspiration uh, for the Leaf School. And so what I did for the next, uh, I started this in 2006. Uh, and so is that 15 or 16 years now? I, we partnered with uh, Coast Salish nations, government agencies, and nonprofits uh, on outdoor activities, mostly, uh, that would engage students in learning the plants and animals uh, and then applying that knowledge to real issues in the community. And to give you a few examples of the things that we've done over the years, one of our early projects was documenting a juvenile Dungeness crab uh, and spot prawn habitat on our local beaches. Uh, and this was one of our early policy successes because we were partnering not just with Tulalip tribes, we were partnering with the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife and Washington State University's Beach Watchers program uh, to uh, basically conduct the first studies in our area of what the habitat needs of these specific species were crabs and spot prawn. And economically, these are the the biggest fisheries in our region. They're very valuable other than salmon. Salmon also is, but they're right up there with salmon in terms of the economic value uh, for our region. And so because we documented where these uh, spot prawn and crab were, were raising their young basically uh, and uh, growing up into the different stages of their life, uh, what different parts of the beach they were living on, I, we were able to get the Department of Fish and Wildlife to change uh, land management in our local area to protect that habitat. And so it provided great benefit for the tribes uh, because the tribes depend upon uh, harvesting crab and spot prawn along with salmon for their livelihood. Uh, but so do sports fishermen. Sports fishermen uh, and women uh, would also harvest these uh, animals and uh, so we could help protect them. So we started getting early on these big uh, kind of policy successes. Uh, another example I was thinking about because I'm here in Salt Lake and I, I got a smoothie this morning and I couldn't believe they would serve a styrofoam uh, cup. You know, we don't do that in Washington, you know, except for a, a few. Uh, uh, most companies in Washington won't do that. And in fact, in many places, plastics and uh, there's significant restrictions on plastics and styrofoam because they're really destructive to the environment. So one of our uh, projects as well was documenting plastic pollution in the Puget Sound uh, because it has, again, direct negative impacts on the tribe subsistence uh, strategies and their economic uh, enterprises. And it harms animals, you know, that, that are getting uh, killed because of it or getting caught in uh, plastic or ingesting plastic. Uh, and so our studies looked at how much plastic was in the, the sand on our beaches. Uh, and then uh, a local city councilman in uh, Edmonds gets word of our work and says, uh, we want to propose a uh, plastic bag ban in the city of Edmonds. Uh, and so they had my students come and present their research to the city council and the city of Edmonds passed one of the first plastic bag bans in the, in the world. Mm, nice. Uh, and uh, now this trend is going all across the world. Uh, there are significant restrictions now across the state of Washington on the use of plastic bags. Uh, even Starbucks is stopping using straws. Uh, and we got to play a very active role in changing the environment and getting students directly involved and and they're seeing i can make a difference in my community i can go before the city council uh and tell the story about what i'm finding on the beach and the city council changes the rules and not only does the city of edmonds do it but then the city of seattle does it and then you get cities all over the world that are that are doing these same sorts of things and it's very empowering yeah uh, so it became a really incredible uh way to teach uh, a few uh, other examples, uh, you know, I'm, one of my favorite activities outside of uh, my work had been wildlife tracking. Uh, and uh, so, you know, learning learning that where animals uh, hide, what their tracks look like, uh, what how does feeding sign of an animal look uh, on, a, on a plant and learning to identify that, uh, that kind of 
in native communities, you think of a, of a scout. That was kind of my, my kind of role model aspiration when I was a kid is I really wanted to be like a scout. You know, I could, I, maybe it was being raised in a boy scouts, right? <laughs> is that, you know, you, a, a scout is that person that can go out and figure out what's going on uh, around you. Uh, and, you know, in, in a lot of times it's in warfare, right? But it's also in hunting and gathering uh, everyday activities. Yeah. Uh, and so uh, I, I got certified uh, in as a wildlife tracker. There's a whole international uh, program of certification called Cyber Tracker run by an anthropologist out of South Africa. Uh, and so my wife and I went through the certification processes and then that enables us to have you know, scientifically credible data that can have a direct impact on policies. And I got students involved in that. Uh, so they're out uh, monitoring the return of wolves. We documented some of the first wolves coming back to the state of Washington, or at least the larger project that we participated in, documented the first wolves coming back to the Cascade Mountains in Washington. We helped reintroduce fishers, which is a type of a weasel, uh, into Olympic National Park, into Cascades National Park. Uh, so we're really starting to have this you know, again, very impactful relationship. And we started out doing these big projects in the mountains, but then we started coming closer to home. We started monitoring. Uh, I found out our local county was putting in wildlife passage structures under the roads so that animals could get under the road. And this is a big issue in Utah. Utah's got some of the uh, great wildlife passage structures along with Washington uh, in uh, kind of leading the nation in developing safe ways for animals to, to cross the road. Uh, and so we would use these cameras and wildlife tracking skills to help cities, counties, and the tribes manage the movement of animals through uh, green belts, through uh, their traditional lands, uh, and uh, then make better policy decisions as a result of that. So it was a really great way to have students learning, but impacting the world around them. Uh, so they're learning about tribes while they're assisting, say, the Snoqualmie tribe with monitoring uh, elk uh, in a very sacred place because the Snoqualmie tribe that we're working with wanted to build a cultural center uh, above Snoqualmie Falls, which is this iconic uh, tourist site in, in Washington. And it's also near the, the, the birthplace of uh, the Snoqualmie people or the origin site, the creation site. Uh, and so they don't want to disturb the creation site. It's also a very important elk migration route uh, through there. And so we put cameras into this region near these sacred sites uh, and uh, help them document uh, when and where uh, elk and deer were moving through, what other animals were present. We were surprised, actually, because in this region, it's, a, it's along a river corridor, but in this region, there's a city all around. Yet the, we documented these bears raising their offspring uh, in, in the city. Uh, we had uh, bobcats. We had uh, coyotes, lots of coyotes. Coyotes raising pups uh, and all in the city. You know? And it starts students like, wow, you know, here I am not realizing what's, what's in my own neighborhood. Uh, and we... Uh, basically got them interconnected with their, their own. Another one of the projects we did was an ethnobotany, a lot of ethnobotany. Ethnobotany is the study of plants and people and the relationship between plants and people. So we did things like we built uh, gardens, we built trails, uh, traditional knowledge trails. We, we helped harvest, worked with the tribes to harvest, to learn to weave, to learn to, to work with the plants, to learn to uh, create and use medicines. Uh, and, one of the really impactful projects we worked on was we built an ethnobotanical garden with the Snohomish tribe. And so Edmonds uh, Community College is in Snohomish County. So it's named after uh, the Snohomish or the, the Stahobes people uh, who are the, the caretakers of our traditional land there. Uh, and so the Stahobes or Snohomish are legally represented by two entities. One is a federally recognized tribe called the Tulalip tribes that we worked with on a number of projects. 
the other is the Snohomish tribe, which is basically people who didn't move to the reservation, but still had native ancestry. They'd stayed off the reservation oftentimes because it was native women who married white men. Uh, a story that resonated with me, given my ancestry. Uh, and they ended up being basically disenfranchised uh, by U.S. law, not treated as as even Indian legally. Mm. Uh, and so the Snohomish are a federally unrecognized tribe. They're a landless tribe, where Tulalip tribes is a rather wealthy tribe. So if you went, if you did what the government told you to, you went and you lived on the reservation, uh, then today you have that opportunity to, to be able to develop uh, casinos and the business enterprises there. But if you resisted the government and you tr tried to hang on to your traditional ways and you uh, say married a white man so that you could continue to live in your traditional land because he could homestead uh, and, and you maintain that deep connection, these women and their descendants were disenfranchised uh, and not federally recognized and left without land, without resources. Uh, and so we particularly wanted to work with them. And it so happened to be that one of the key families in the Snohomish tribe was a Mormon family, an ex-Mormon family, I guess would be most appropriate in that they, I don't know if even ex-Mormon is right. They had, they'd been baptized and they'd gone to church for a while. They were the typical Mormon. <laughs> and I, I think what I mean is if you really look at who are Mormons and what the church is counting is the people <laughs> that are there for a week or two weeks or a couple of months. Yeah. That's the mo that's the numerically highest number. So they were those kind of Mormons. They had, they had some neighbors that were Mormons and that had encouraged them to, to come to church and they had joined for a <laughs> while and they went to church for a while, uh, but they continued to do their native things and they continued to practice their native religions. And, uh, their activity was, they were inactive. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and so this, this family, uh, one of the, was the vice chair of the tribe, Donald Bond. Uh, and we developed a really close relationship with him uh, because of that Mormon connection. Uh, he ended up adopting my wife and I into this, the Snohomish, into his family and the Snohomish tribe by implication. Uh, and in a, public event in an ethnobotanical garden we called Stolja Ali, a place of medicine in the city of Linwood right next to our uh, campus. Uh, and so that was a, an important part of, you know, my kind of being engagement with uh, the Snohomish tribe and very personally meaningful to me is Donald Bond, who's now passed, uh, Swa Swakalam is his indigenous name. Uh, and but he had a big big impact on me and is an important elder in teaching me some traditional uh, ways and traditional knowledge. Another one of my favorite ethnobotany projects, and this is for the decolonization nerds that may be in the audience. Okay, uh, my wife Carrie was working at the Indigenous Wellness Research Institute at the University of Washington, and one of her jobs was to host international scholars uh, that are coming to the University of Washington that are Indigenous scholars. I, and in helping them engage with local tribes. Uh, and I, the one of the most famous of the scholars of decolonization is a Maori woman by the name of Linda Smith. Uh, and Linda Smith, I, along with a number of her Maori, Maori and Hawaiian, Native Hawaiian colleagues were coming to the University of Washington a few years ago and were looking for activities to do. And they were coming in May and May is the time to harvest uh, cedar bark. And I'd had a former student who had asked me if, if they, they were going to be doing a timber harvest on uh, some property, some communal property. She lived in like a commune, uh, a nudist colony, actually, to be kind of blunt, uh, near Issaquah. Uh, and weren't you in Issaquah? Yeah, yeah I sure in, was. In Issaquah, so yeah. Tiger Mountain nudist colony. I don't know if you no, ever, if you I had hung no out there, idea. <laughs> I had no idea I lived close to a nudist colony for seven <laughs> yeah. years. Well, one of my students was on the board for that Tiger Mountain nudist colony, and uh, they were going to do this timber harvest. And uh, so they asked, they wanted to salvage some of the plants. And they said, they said what could we do? Because we'd done a number of plant salvage projects when this student had been a member of my class. And I said, well, 
if, are there a lot of cedars on this property? And she said, yeah. And I said, well, how about if we harvest uh, some cedar bark? Uh, and that could be used by the canoe families and, and tribes for that purpose. Uh, and so we organized a cedar bark harvest at the same time that it, Linda Smith is coming. And so we got to basically strip cedar in a nudist park with Linda Smith, the icon of decolonization methodology. Uh, and for those who are decolonization nerds, you'll know how valuable of an experience that is, mm. is she really developed the field of decolonizing methodologies that would inspire the work I'm going to talk about in the next couple of interviews. And an interesting connection to you, John, in Issaquah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> a couple of other projects that we worked on were salmon stream restoration projects. We helped uh, document uh, the Steel Guamish tribe document uh, coho salmon escapement. That's when that's how many salmon come back up the river and what percentages versus are harvested versus mm. uh, spawn uh, and be able to document the percentage of uh, spawning. A lot of fun hanging out in the rivers. We'd help raise a, a Chinook uh, fry uh, for brood stocking, basically catch the fish in the river before they, before they mate and then take them to the, uh, to the hatchery for artificial uh, mating, I guess. Uh, and probably the most significant, though, of those salmon restoration projects was returning salmon to Japanese gulch. So Japanese gulch is at the site of the Point Elliot Treaty. Uh, the United States signed treaties with uh, the Coast Salish Nations in 1855. And one of the sites of those was uh, near our campus, uh, a, a place, uh, a town called Makotio or Bekotuyu, uh, to use the... Uh, the Lachutzi term for uh, that town, which is anglicized as Makaltio. And there we, uh, the, United, the United States had basically promised tribes that they could continue to hunt and fish and harvest in their usual and accustomed places in perpetuity in return for uh, getting uh, the land in that area. And so for our students, they're living on the traditional lands of the Stahobs and other Coast Salish peoples yet the price if you will that the united states had promised uh to the tribes was not being paid uh that is if you could continue to hunt and fish in your usual and accustomed places but salmon were exterminated from those places then you can't really continue to fish salmon that are no longer there and so i uh, we embarked in a project with Tulalip tribes and with uh the city of uh, Muckleteo and Snohomish County uh, to bring salmon back uh, to that uh, site. Uh, and this involved a, an archaeological project to make sure that we weren't uh, negatively affecting uh, cultural resources, especially those of Japanese communities that had lived there also in that area, gave it its name Japanese Gulch. And so I led an archaeology field school there. Uh, and then we did uh, the monitoring of the effectiveness of this project to see if salmon, in fact, did return. So I spent many years walking streams in the winter, uh, counting the number of salmon with students. Uh, and, you know, it doesn't sound very Mormon, but I'll get to it, it in terms of how it is Mormon after I talk about just a couple more projects. We built a, a campus community <clears throat> farm. Uh, and uh, this was basically like it started as a community garden, kind of grew to a farm to teach organic farming and uh, biodynamic uh, ways of uh, raising food in a more traditional way. We did a lot of native foods in this. So we uh, planted camas, for example. Uh, we had a lot of uh, local huckleberries and uh, kind of integrating the native stuff. But we also had non-native uh, plants from around the world that, that would grow in our region uh, and we would. Uh, grow them and and then the food that we raised would go to food banks and to feed students because a lot of our students we have a food bank now on campus you know they don't they don't have a lot of the the food resources that they, they need so they could volunteer in the farm and uh, take food home or they could come to the food pantry where we would just give it to anybody who needed it and uh that that became a big part of our work and it's still it's still ongoing uh, we also built a cultural kitchen that we called uh, 
Wild Ali, which means literally the place of the cooking fire. Uh, and uh, they're bringing cultural traditions together with the raising of food uh, and uh, doing salmon bakes on campus for, and for our powwows and for our salmon festivals. Uh, and uh, then I, I, would, I also spent about uh, a de decade taking students on Tribal Canoe Journey. Uh, Tribal Canoe Journey is uh, traveling the pathways uh, of the ancestors. Uh, it's kind of like the Mormon, Mormon trek. It's like, you know, you, know, if you, you guys know what tre the trek is. Yeah, right? for sure. <laughs> and so the, the trek, basically, you get hand carts, which very few Mormons actually pull hand carts across the plains. But you pull can hand carts and you walk a portion of the trail. Uh, well, a canoe journey is, is, is somewhat similar to that. It, but you build canoes. Uh, which is the traditional method of uh, travel, uh, and then travel in these canoes along the ancestral pathways. It's become a huge, huge event. It's much bigger than than trek in in, in native communities of the uh, uh, of British Columbia and Washington and Oregon. Uh, so these are, I mean, it, it takes the the tribes that will host. Because the, the host passes from one nation to another, kind of like the Olympics. Uh, for a, a tribe to host is, is you know, tens of millions of dollars they need to raise to be able to do this because it becomes a potlatch, a big giveaway. And potlatches are an expression of the giving and reciprocity of Native cultures in that when you acquire wealth, which the tribes are doing through casinos now, mm -hmm. The traditional way to deal with that wealth is not to accumulate it, not to become rich, but the traditional way is to give it back to the community. Mm. Uh, and so powwows and the uh, canoe journey became ways that that wealth was given back to the community. So when we would host a powwow, uh, the casino tribes would give us money that we would uh, then we would turn around and give uh, to the dancers and the singers and uh, and help feed everybody. And that's why we needed places like a cultural kitchen. We, we'd, we would feed everybody who came to our campus. And so it, it's a really kind of fascinating way of, it's like the antithesis of capitalism. Uh, and, you know, it's like, it's actually kind of like the great piece in the Book of Mormon, mm. where you, you have this ethic of every, everything is in common. So that this accumulation of wealth doesn't stay in the upper echelons of society, but there are mechanisms for transferring it to those who have less. Uh, and so uh, the, these host nations will gift food. When we traveled on Tribal Canoe Journey, and I, I tell the story of this in a book called Decolonizing Mormonism, A, a Tribal Journey Back to Mormon Studies, I tell how we, as we're traveling from one nation to another, we were fed, housed everywhere we went. We never paid. We never, uh, we, there were, you know, like you would with a hotel or something. We didn't do that. It was a gift. Now, b because we received a gift, we gave gifts in return. So what were the gifts we gave in return? Well, for one, our presence as diplomats from another nation, okay? Because uh, we were traveling, I had my students and I were traveling with canoe families that represented different nations. And so when we would come to that new nation and visit their territory, uh, we would share our songs and dances. That was the, the biggest gift is the songs and dances, the traditions. These are things that have been outlawed. In fact, potlatches themselves have been outlawed for over 50 years in the United States and Canada. Uh, so we're bringing back those outlawed traditions, bringing back the voices of the ancestors, literally in song, okay? Because song carries the voices of the ancestors. Uh, and we're sharing those uh, as a free gift uh, to the people that are hosting us. Uh, we also would make uh, things, traditional things, you know, make things out of cedar. So that's why we're out there harvesting Cedar Park is that we were uh, making gifts, uh, say a headband or a hat or uh, or clothing, uh, that would be a gift to our our host nations. Uh, and so it, 
it kind of integrated me into this whole ethos of a different way of viewing the world. Uh, and I'll come back to in the later interview to how that connects to the, to the Book of Mormon and, uh, and the idea of having everything in common. But it gave me a, a portrait of some of the indigenous cultures in my region that I think in, and, and the indigenous practices that were wide, more widespread across the United States that I think impacted Joseph Smith's thinking. Uh, and there are actually some specific Iroquois stories uh, of a great piece that get replicated in the Book of Mormon that mm. we'll talk about a little bit later. But as I was, as, so I, uh, as I was thinking about this experience and preparing for today, actually last night, uh, it dawned on me because I was thinking, I'm afraid of losing the Mormon stories, people. How is this Mormon to tell this story? And it dawned on me, you know what I was doing? I didn't think of it this way, but what I was doing is we were serving others. We were uplifting the poor. We were feeding the hungry. We were healing the sick. And not just people, but plants and animals. We were restoring balance and harmony and we were decolonizing anthropology and even Edmonds College. And here I want to pause for a second and, and say on decolonizing, anthropology as a field has an exploitative history with Native Americans. So that an anthropologist in, in the past would visit a Native community, extract information, uh, take that information back to their home, publish a book, get tenure, uh, build a career in a way that doesn't necessarily give back to Native communities. That's not the way most anthropology is done today, okay? Because we recognize that that was exploitative, okay? And that when we're, when we're going to a community today, as I mentioned, when we went to that Zapotec community, we mm -hmm. asked, what do you need? And for us, it was an ethical dilemma that they gave us back. <laughs> Right. And it also was a dilemma that breaks down stereotypes of Indians as these natural ecologists. Okay. Uh, but it is really important that you give back. And so this field school that I built was around supporting native communities locally, addressing their needs. Uh, in return, they gifted my students with a learning experience unlike any other. I mean, the, the career that I've been able to have uh, is like a, a dream job. And you can see why I, I was not involved in Mormon studies. I was too busy uh, following wolves and fishers and uh, salmon and catching salmon. And, you know, I mean, it was, it was, it took me away from Mormon studies, but it was so Mormon. I was doing exactly what I'd been taught mm -hmm. and it was so Christian. It was exactly, it was Christian ideals, even though it was native ideals too. Okay. And so native people didn't frame this as Christian, uh, but they did, uh, would frame it as balance and reciprocity. Uh, those things were really important. And taking care of the poor is a very fundamental native value. And hospitality, very fundamental native value. Diplomacy. And, and this is one portion that I really, really learned from is when we would go from one nation to another, it was interesting to see that the stories changed. Okay. So let's say there's an origin story. I mentioned we worked with the, the Snoqualmie and the Snoqualmie origin story places human origins uh, near Snoqualmie Falls. Well, we worked with the uh, Kalalam nations uh in uh, the port angeles area uh and there is this uh dam uh that uh, had blocked the the river uh, the elwha river and covered up their creation site okay and their creation site was in uh the elwha river underneath this dam uh, eventually that dam would be removed and that site would come back to to the surface or and that would be really powerful for 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 us to be able to be a part of that as well but what was interesting is that the Kalalam 
and the Snoqualmie had no problem sharing each other's stories, even though they had different creation sites. Mm. Okay. And one was not a contradiction with the other. So when, when we were in Sklalem territory, they would tell their story. When we were in uh, Snoqualmie territory, they would tell their story. And when Snoqualmie were in Sklalem territory, they would still share their story, but it, they wouldn't say, well, really, it's not that uh, Native people came from uh, the, uh, from the Elwha River. They really came from the Snoqualmie River. Uh, it, they didn't have that type of argument. Yeah. Okay. Both stories could coexist and be equally true. That's your story. This is our story. What a model for thinking about Mormonism, right? And how is the, the Book of Mormon different than that? Is that is that what you did in Mexico with the Book of Mormon? Mm -hmm. Yeah. No. <laughs> Not really, right? Like, because yeah. in Me in when we're taught about the Book of Mormon, like this is the truth and the only truth, right? Like there's no way. And everything has to be fit into that, into the Book of Mormon narrative. Right. So that, yeah. So a missionary comes uh, to tell the Book of Mormon, say, well, we have the story of Lehi and Nephi mm -hmm. and Laman. That's the origin. A native person says, well, actually, uh, our ancestors came from the Elwha River, mm -hmm. uh, from a creation site on the Elwha River. Uh, the missionary response <laughs> is, well, that's wrong. Yeah. Instead of, wow, that's an interesting story. That's, 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 a, that's a powerful story. I could learn from that. Uh, and so within Native communities, that sharing of stories is an act of diplomacy. So to uh, kind of bring the rest of this interview Back around what I want to talk about, if it's all right, is how I came back to re-engaging with Mormon story, studies. Yeah, I'll just say that you know, as as I'm listening to kind of your enumeration of many of the projects you've been involved with throughout your career, it is a Mormon story in the sense that you're a Mormon mm -hmm. and you're a distinguished researcher, and this is your Mormon story. Mm -hmm. So I'm okay with that. Uh, standing alone. Because uh, part of that's because I know you. Part of that's because I know you've had a big influence. And part of that's because as I looked through this, like it's popular to be anti-racist. Mm -hmm. It's popular in progressive circles to be pro-environment. It's, it's popular to care about animal rights. Uh, but it's another thing to actually do things that contribute in those areas. Mm -hmm. And we live in this society today. There's this podcast that I, um, that my, my oldest child shared with me recently from, uh, from a podcast called the hidden brain. Oh, and, yeah. uh, and the title of the episode that I listened to, and I'm looking it up because it's kind of that, uh, it was that influential to me. It basically talks about this idea of nowadays people post on social media. It's called passion isn't enough. And I really recommend mm -hmm. this episode. Mm -hmm. Did you, have you I haven't chance? heard that, that but I've okay. heard of the hidden brain. Yeah. So, so it talks about how in, in, in modern times with social media, people are confused about what it, you know, the difference between, tweeting something or sharing an image or raging on Facebook about some passion that they, they think represents social justice. They're confused between that and actually making a difference in the world. They almost think that if they watch MSNBC or Fox news, whether if a Democrat watches MSNBC or a Republican watches Fox News, that somehow they've contributed something to uh, the broader society in a meaningful way. But it's almost become more of a spectator sport. You know how, yeah. like, yeah, when you watch professional sports, you're not actually playing the sport. You're not actually building your health. You're not actually gaining any skills. You're just watching other people play. Yeah. And in modern society, that's how politics have become. You're not actually contributing to anything 
by like saying Trump's evil or Biden's evil. Like you're not doing anything there. It's just like you're putting on your jersey and cheering for your team. Yeah, that's I think that's a great <laughs> contrast because when so when I'm doing these projects in the, in the community, okay, I am working with Republicans and Democrats. Yeah. Okay. And I know them by first name, you know, we're, you know, we, we know that we might support a different presidential candidate, uh, or we know that we have differences, uh, in terms of, uh, very fundamental values, but we sit down together and we say, we want to bring salmon back to uh, the side of the point Elliott treaty. Uh, how are we going to do that? Yeah. Uh, and I worked with business, you know, very pro-business Republican leaders who say, if I'm going to need to comply with the Clean Water Act, I want it to be meaningful. They said, if I, I could just check off a box and reroute water uh, along the Snohomish County Airport, uh, and that would comply with the law. Or I could look at the spirit of the law, and I could say, if if the Clean Water Act is going to require me to reorient water, what if I worked with the local tribes and I worked with the city, and instead of just putting water into a, another detention box under the runways, I uh, instead we route that uh, cleaning up of the water uh, th by putting a stream back in its historic channel. Mm -hmm. uh, and provide all this extra salmon habitat. And so I saw very creative ideas uh, coming from both sides politically, Republican and Democrat, and coming together, working together, making a huge difference, you know, earning uh, a lot of awards. We, we got a lot of awards for this work over the years. And, you know, like the Puget Sound Regional Council, uh, recognize one of our, our projects as uh vision 2040 award for you know really kind of implementing well this was republicans and democrats working together yeah it can be done and that's you know yeah. and we need we need more of that bipartisan work because with the spectator politics going on it becomes yeah. echo chambers we all know right. this now facebook yeah. or twitter any of these social media things they just end up serving you the posts and the content that you already agree with. And then you're posting and only people that agree with you are seeing what you post. And so we can't confuse social media expression with actual contribution or action. And so I really respect that you have been working in that realm of meaningful action, but it's, it's unglamorous. It's unsexy. It's drudgery. And it's like you said, it's not romantic work, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And I'll just say this last thing in this podcast episode from the hidden brain that we should include in the show notes. Um, passion is not enough. They talk about how the KKK um, has been offering uh, drug addiction recovery services in Appalachia because they know that if you can make someone feel helped in, on a personal level, it's kind of like when, when like New York politicians used to deliver hams to, you know, to, to buy votes, basically, mm -hmm. if you, it's one thing, if you just put out rhetoric, but if you actually make meaningful personal connections with people, that's going to influence them much more than raging on social media. Um, and, and so we have to be really you know, and, and I think if you study, and I don't want to just pick, um, you know, uh, let's just say Middle East terrorism, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you find a way to make people feel helped and seen, you can recruit them for all sorts of things that aren't necessarily good, right? Yeah. And so, so like the good guys, whoever they are, and we all think we're good guys, you know, but if we don't learn to touch people on direct local initiatives in ways where they feel helped and loved and supported, I don't know that we have any hope of bridging these kind of uh, highly 
highly insulated echo chamber kind of divides. Yeah. So I'm just I'm just repeating back to you the value in my perception of your life's work and what I just heard and why I feel like it's yeah, I don't know how many views it's gonna get, <laughs> but uh for me, I, I deeply respect this work. I do see it as reflecting the best impulses of the Mormonism that we were both raised in. So in that sense, it's very much a Mormon story. And I, I would hope people would care enough to pay attention and to learn from your example. And I also get the sense that Carrie's been a really important partner in pretty much all this work that you've done. In, indeed. You know, and it, it's ironic that you bring up social media because <clears throat> it was partly social media that, that brought me back to Mormon studies. Yeah. Seeing that, seeing that, divisive uh, rhetoric, particularly around the Mitt Romney campaign of 2012. Yeah. Uh, by that time, social media is quite fired up and I'm quite active in, in social media, especially on Facebook. And, mm -hmm. uh, and it, so it was in front of me all the time and I don't normally watch uh, political news channels, but I do around election times. And, you know, it's kind of, it was kind of the Mormon moment and, you know, in some ways, I had all these hopes of Mitt Romney as, as, as somebody different. And then he would go to these private events and say these horrible things. Uh, and then it'd get recorded and shared. And it's like, oh, why does that have to be the image of Mormonism that's going out to the world, you know, that is, is disparaging to the poor? I mean, that's not what we teach. Uh, but apparently what he would say in private events to particular funders, you know, that want to hear that type of message. And it's like, Oh, ouch. Or, you know, when he's in, uh, Palestine talking about kind of a cultural superiority uh, approach and uh, demeaning the Palestinians in relationship to the Israelis. It's just like, this is not what we should be. Uh, and, it just it, it i felt like as a as a scholar of mormonism as you know I, admittedly i'm not an active latter day saint in that i don't go to church and i i don't pay tithing i didn't need that to feed the hungry and take care of the poor uh i didn't need the church institution for that but culturally i see myself as very much mormon i uh, and i wish that we could be our best selves uh and and so the mitt romney campaign just being in my face all the time got me thinking okay i've got some undone work i've got work that still needs to be done that yes i've passed off the work to to native scholars in the sense that i really feel that the story of lamanites is an indigenous story to tell but some things started happening. Native scholars were coming back to me, asking me to get involved in their projects. Uh, some other things that happened, I was asked to write uh, book reviews. Uh, one of those was for Nova Religio, it's a journal. Uh, I was asked to write a review of Paul Gutjar's Book of Mormon, a biography. And this is kind of, it's a good book in many ways. It, it tells the story of of a book as a the life of a book when i read it there were no native stories none he didn't even cite a native author i mean it, i think he might have cited me but i don't think i really i'm more white than native uh and i had reviewed years ago uh terrell givens uh book uh i forget the name of his book on the book of mormon uh and he had done the same thing no native authors uh and it's like why why are you know why didn't we learn between terrell gibbons book on the book of mormon and paul guchar he's not even mormon and he's writing a, a book about the book of mormon and native voices are still absent and so uh uh that just kind of hit me like there needs to be more work done by non-native scholars engaging native scholarship because actually native Mormons are doing incredible scholarship right now. 
but it's not being engaged. Uh, and so there's a role for me to come back to. Uh, I also reviewed the Oxford Handbook of Mormonism. Uh, and <laughs> interestingly, uh, the Oxford, this, the Oxford Hand, Handbook of Mormonism talks about how the church is changing, how the demographics are, are different, how women's roles are changing within the church. Yet, four out of five authors are men. More than half are employed by the LDS church. Uh, one person of color was a co-author of one article. Yet here's all these demographics saying the, the church is huge in Mexico. Or in Africa. Or in Africa. But where's the African voices? Where are the Mexican voices? Uh, and uh, so I'm like, we need to change the way we're doing Mormon studies. And, and we need a white settler voice saying that. And so uh, I'm stepping up to say that, that we need to change the way we're doing our work. And I think Mormon stories, as I see it as part of this, you know, you may not be in an academic institution, but I see this as part of Mormon's, Mormon studies. And I think your work that you've done with uh, the Lamanite Voices section, by bringing on Gerardo, uh, by uh, having Jen, uh, having uh, other women uh, who have joined you as well, uh, those are important steps that we need to do. And you and I have had conversations about these. So I think we, we see eye to eye on here that we've got to make some changes uh, in how we're, we're telling and whose stories are being told and how they're being told. Uh, and so in general, indigenous scholarship within the field of Mormon studies remains undervalued and underappreciated, and we need to step up. So, you know, some of the ways that that I've tried to do that is responding to these requests from native scholars. And I want to just highlight, and this is partly a message to you, John. <laughs> I, I want you to know uh, what's happening and place people that you can focus on and other podcasters can. Uh, so, you know, you did help Angelo and I talk about our article that we did together, Rejecting Racism in Any Form, Latter-day Saint Religion, Rhetoric, and Repatriation, in conjunction with the Bears Ears Mo National Monument in Utah. But really the critical idea we wanted to bring across in that article is to bring into the discussion an issue that's raging across Native communities, and that is issues of repatriation. And this is where both Mormonism and anthropology have failed Native people, in that both Mormonism and anthropology has depended upon taking Native bodies, Native artifacts, and taking them out of context, stealing them in many cases, and then producing settler stories about these, which is really what the Book of Mormon does. The Book of Mormon is a the story of the Book of Mormon is the story of grave robbery, of taking from Native people a supposed set of gold plates from really that was supposed to be guarded by Moroni, a treasure guardian, stealing from him the gold plates and then publishing the story as our own, as if this is the true story of Native America. Uh, and so that's what we try to explore there. Wait, did we steal? Did Joseph steal the plates or was he given them by Ronai? Ah, that is a good question. Uh, and, uh, and, and, you know, if you read, there's actually a historical element to that, right? So if you read the, the, the earliest accounts, so like, say, Joseph Smith Sr.'s interview uh, that he did around 1830, uh, that has it much more embedded within the the treasure uh, lore of the day, which is much more like manipulating. You got to manipulate treasure guarding in order to get the plates. Mm. Uh, and so that is a, a key component to uh, the acquisition. So those earliest stories, but it's not the way it's remembered later, mm -hmm. right? So the way it's stored, told later is a story of gift. And it could be either, right? I mean, it, it, and I think part of it's the difference between Joseph Sr. and his son, Joseph Jr., and the way they viewed the world. 
Uh, it, but I do like the idea of, 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 of the gifting, but then they also need to be returned. And to some degree, you say, well, the gold plates were given back, okay, to Moroni anyway. Uh, but really, they weren't Joseph Smith's to begin with. Uh, what, what should have happened is that this, this occurred in Seneca territory. And so Joseph Smith should have been engaging with the Seneca people uh, and said, look, we, we found what uh, I think belongs to you. Uh, could you help me uh, in in translating that? And <laughs> I don't think they know referred to Egyptian. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, they, you know. So I, I, a little aside here. This is not in my outline here, but I'm going to going to tell I'm just this being here. silly. No, I'm going to tell it here because it it's good. Uh, I tell this story in an article called uh, "Views from Turtle Island." Okay, and. Uh, this article is in the Paul Grave Handbook of Global Mormonism. And right now they're charging you $30 online uh, for this article. I don't get any of that. And I have permission to share with colleagues uh, free copies by the publisher. Uh, so if you consider yourself a colleague, uh, please uh, <laughs> message me an email address that I can send you a copy. Uh, and uh, you can find me on Facebook, message me, and and I'll give you a free copy. Uh, but anyway, in this story, it, which Lori Taylor, she's an historian, recorded uh, in the 1990s, Seneca have their own story, uh, or the Iroquois people, and it's been, the version she gets has been passed around by a number of people. A key person in passing around is a Tuscarora activist by the name of Mad Bear Anderson. Uh, and this story he told widely in the 60s, 70s, uh, uh, and early 80s uh, across the United States. So you'll encounter it in Native communities all the time. Uh, and this story reshapes the, the origin of the Book of Mormon. So that what this story says actually happened is kind of the response to Mormons. This is what really happened. If you want to know what the real story of Mormonism, <laughs> the real story is that uh, there were a couple of uh, Seneca farmhands who worked together with Joseph Smith, uh, and uh, they really wanted to take some of their teachings uh, and help pack, repackage them for a, a white audience. Uh, and so they uh, talked to Joseph Smith to see if uh, he wanted to partner in this, uh, and uh, they uh, had some gold that they had in, it, it obtained from the payment from, from the British for the War of 1812. Uh, and uh, they took that gold uh, and inscribed using picture writing, their own picture writing, uh, some of their stories. Uh, and uh, then passed that off to Joseph Smith for him to pretend to find. He pretended to find uh, this gold plates, according to the according to this indigenous narrative, uh, and so he finds the gold plates, and then he translates them uh, from the Iroquois picture writing uh, into uh, the Book of Mormon. Uh, but in doing it, Joseph Smith kind of overdid the Christian stuff. <laughs> he kind of exaggerated that portion a little too much. He didn't get everything right. Uh, but, you know, it did provide a, a way to, to take the best of Iroquois teachings and the best of Christianity and kind of put them together in a way, in a package that, that would work well uh, for white people. Uh, so in that story, the Book of Mormon is not to redeem Native people. It's Native people trying to redeem white people. Uh, in that story also, what happens to the gold plates? Well, the gold plates are returned uh, to the Seneca. Uh, and in fact, they're still at Tanawanda. The Seneca still have them, according to the story. Uh, Do you believe this? Is this a myth? Is this fiction? Is this like creative fiction? I, lo like I love this story. I love this story. I think it's, I think it's the most true story you will ever encounter. Uh, what the? It's more true than any other story of the origin of the Book of Mormon. Uh, and I, I think, 
<laughs> or listen, like some <laughs> listeners wouldn't know about your your later st- st- studies, yeah. but some of the stuff you found about native people that were very prominent in Joseph Smith's time. Yeah, that's very similar. Their 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 stories are very similar to pe- characters in the Book of Mormon. Mm-hmm. So that's yeah. why you're saying that this story is probably the most true out of all. So when I use true there, let me qualify a little bit <laughs> to say that I think there are mythological truths or or you might say truths that are more true than history itself uh, and the, in that story. So there are deeper truths that transcend history. Uh, and I think Joseph Smith might have thought that way too, okay? I'm open to that possibility. Yeah. Yeah. He might have thought that way too. Yeah. Uh, there are some problems with that story. Okay. And I, I do <laughs> it, some, some historical problems, but there, I do, I, there, I did a Sunstone presentation that explored that story a little bit and, and some of that. This is a real story that someone has somewhere. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And so it, it, I re, recap it in the views views from Turtle Island article, but I also recap it in a Sunstone presentation from a couple of years ago uh, that's available on YouTube. And it, it's called, uh, grief and gratitude in the Haudenosaunee Great Peace, uh, and I I look at you know who who might have influenced Joseph Smith, and uh, I have found, for example, uh, several uh, veterans of uh, the War of eighteen twelve uh, that were in the Palmyra area uh, and may have had interactions with Joseph Smith. Okay, but. There, I'll tell you the, the historical problem with that story is that uh, the British, uh, well, first of all, those veterans of the War of 1812 fought on the American side, not the British side. Uh, and then the British were notorious for not paying their soldiers. Uh, and so the idea that the British had actually paid <laughs> gold. in gold, <laughs> uh, I can't verify that historically that it actually happened, but I can show many instances of uh, Iroquois, specifically Seneca soldiers being upset that the British weren't paying them uh, as they had promised. Uh, so, you know, there are some historical details that are questionable, <laughs> but I, it is a, a, it is a fascinating story. And it's, it's kind of telling those stories is what I'm trying to do a little bit with my work now. And I, I'll mention just a couple of other things before we, we wrap this up, uh, this session. I, so I, a, responded to a request from Joanna Brooks and Gina Colvin uh, to write an article in Decolonizing Mormonism, a book that I would highly recommend. Uh, and that one recaps a lot of the story I've told here, Decolonization on the Salish Sea, A Tribal Journey Back to Mormon Studies. Uh, and then working, this is the one that I was doing six years ago when I came here to interview with you. And I didn't talk much in detail about it because we didn't have time. But it was an invitation from P. Jane Hafen and Brendan Rensink. Uh, P. Jane Hafen is a Taos Pueblo Mormon, and Brendan Rensink is a professor at BYU. Uh, and it's an article called Other Scriptures Restoring Voices of the Gontawisas to an Open Canon. And that explores the stories of Jesus in Iroquois oral tradition uh, in comparison uh, to the Book of Mormon. Uh, and, you know, interestingly published by BYU. Uh, and I've also responded to some uh, requests from other scholars. Some of the work is a, a, an article on DNA in the Book of Mormon, getting back into that, called Science, Settlers, and Scripture. That appears in the LDS Gospel Topics series, uh, A Scholarly Engagement, published by Signature Books in 2020. The Matt Harris. Yeah, Matt Harris, you interviewed Breedhurst. about it. Yeah. Yeah. It's a great book. Edited. Yeah. yeah, and so can I you, co-authored that with Angelo Baca. Can you tell us just a little bit of some uh, highlights of that article? Because um, yeah, because we look at the DNA evidence today versus what I'd published back in twenty years, and so kind of the short is that you know twenty years ago there was no DNA evidence to support the Book of Mormon. Uh, today there's no DNA evidence to support the Book of Mormon. <laughs> Okay. It has not changed. But in you're fact, responding to the gospel yeah. topic essay, is that right? Yes, it is. Yeah. And what the the evidence that we were now we we had few strand or few lines of evidence, okay, in, in 20 years ago. And now those lines of uh you know, I mean there's there's 
3 billion base pairs in DNA. Okay. So there's a lot of lines of evidence we can work on, you know, different, uh, uh, kind of markers upon the genome, mm -hmm. uh, are going to tell a story. Okay. So we were, you know, looking at a few dozen, uh, markers at that time now they do hundreds of markers and that's how you're able to you know send your dna into a, a company and they tell you a little bit about your ancestry as a result of it so we have you know much that we can go to that rest of that genome uh, and and ask the same questions we were doing out of a limited number of lineages or, or genetic markers and now we just have you know thousands of them that or at least hundreds uh, that we can do and the same story that there's no connection between ancient Israel and uh, Native America, uh, and you know we look also at the the churches. The churches essay. What we really applaud them for is the statement that uh, the Book of Mormon is more script more spiritual than historical, and I think that's the direction the church is is going to be is headed. It is headed. I mean, Nelson is now going around saying the Book of Mormon is not history. Uh, and so, it, you know, or the president of the church, for those that might not be familiar who I mean by uh, President Nelson. Uh, and so the church is much more willing to admit it's, it's not historical. Uh, yet you have and have had on this show a kind of a pushback within the Mormon community of Rod Meldrum and the Heartland Group trying to push him back on the church leadership and on these scholars at BYU and the church essays uh, and, and, and trying to insist on a literal historical. Uh, event the book yeah but the essay does try to claim i mean it does have that phrase but the whole intent of the essay is to say well we don't know lehi's dna well there's like this four three different options that could have happened with the dna why it's been lost um so it's trying to give yeah. plausibility for historicity right it's right? trying to cover both which is a very clever uh, church leadership <laughs> strategy right, right. Uh, they want to they want to have a little bit for both, and, and so they offer several explanations for why DNA might not might have disappeared, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, those become less reasonable with the more lines of evidence that we have, uh, and uh, they also are deeply problematic in that they aren't consistent with the Book of Mormon, mm -hmm. uh, and they think that's 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 what what gives fuel fuel to the fire of the Heartland movement is because they're actually reading the Book of Mormon and then the essay is actually inconsistent with the Book of Mormon. Uh, and so that dilemma is a tough one. It's a tough one. But anyway, I would encourage people to take a, take a look at that uh, article for, for more detail. Uh, another article I've done is on repatriation called Grave Consequences on Revelation and Repatriation and Blossom as the Cliff Rose, which is a look at environmental legacy in Mormonism. And, and it overlaps a lot with the story I've told today uh, as well. And so some of the viewers wanting to know more can check that out. Uh, and uh, forthcoming in the Journal of Mormon Social Science Association is an article called An Indian Princess and a Mormon Sacagawea, Decolonizing Memories of Our Grandmothers. And in that, I co-author with my wife and daughter, Carrie and Jessica, to look at the stories in our families of indigenous ancestors in white uh, communities and how those can be destructive to native stories and, and native voices and, and trying to call ourselves to task and our families to task for uh, erasing uh, indigenous women's contributions by painting them as Indian princesses or in the case of Carrie's ancestor as a Mormon Sacagawea, her ancestor Panina Shropshire Cotton, I was one of the first one one of the first Native converts to Mormonism, came west on the second wagon train, uh, but has been portrayed by the church as a Sacagawea. She wasn't even on the first wagon train, uh, and you know, so we kind of deconstruct that story, and that's forthcoming for those that are interested, uh, and uh, then. I tell the story of my relationship with Carrie in a book called uh, from called Revising Eternity that just came out last month. Twenty seven Latter Day Saint men reflect on modern uh, relationships, uh, and that article is called From Patriarchy to Matriarchy: A Marital and Spiritual Journey. And 
the part I want to share now is is very brief, and that is something that happened uh, three years ago, three and a half years ago, I that would change the trajectory of my career, uh, and I share in more depth that that story there. But basically, one morning in November of 2018, my wife Carrie wouldn't wake up, and I I couldn't couldn't wake her up, and she was breathing. It was alive, but she it was largely irresponsive. She could could mumble a little bit, and you could tell that she was trying to respond. But uh, I ended up calling nine one one, and she spends three days in a coma uh, before uh, she comes out, uh, and when she comes out we would later learn was a result of a severe brainstem stroke this is an event that our niece told us and she did a research project on this she told us in idaho that only nine percent of the people who have a brainstem stroke like hers of that comparable uh type uh survive uh and fortunately she did survive but when she woke up, she'd lost memory. She'd lost basic abilities because the brain stem is where your basic functions. Interestingly, it's not your your critical functions, uh, but it's or your thinking. It's not your like your critical thinking type functions, but it's your basic like breathing, eating, swallowing, sitting up, walking, talking. Uh, and and the pathways between words in your brain, like your where your memory is and 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 your speech functions, it's those pathway connections between them. So she basically had to learn everything all over again from sitting up, walking, talking, and uh, I basically dropped my my career uh, of this field school uh, and became her caregiver. I had I had not taken sick leave for 20 years, and I'd accumulated a lot of sick leave, uh, and so I've spent most of the last three and a half years either on sick leave or intermittent sick leave, where I do a little bit of work and not a full load, uh, or sabbatical, and have been her caregiver. Uh, she sleeps a lot, so her caregiving gives me a lot of time to do Mormon st studies. And so this has been the most productive since the time of my dissertation in, in producing Mormon uh, material. And so that's why I have so many articles out, is that I can be her caregiver and do Mormon studies. Uh, we tried taking, I tried taking her on another canoe journey and doing one more summer field school, but I found that it was more than I could handle and that I needed to choose. Uh, and I've chosen that I'm going to take an early retirement, uh, focus on her caregiving for the Mormon studies community. The, the good news of that is that I will have some time uh, to do more. I've got a book I'm working on that I plan to finish. Uh, and so I, I'm going to be a, hopefully a pretty active voice in, in Mormon studies in the, the near future is so much as it's, as long as it's compatible with my caregiving uh, duties. Uh, and I won't be able to run the field school that I've run, but I'm working with Edmonds College and my colleagues to to make sure that that at least portions of that legacy continue. Uh, so uh, anyway, that's that article tells that story. What I want to do to to wrap this up is give a kind of a precursor for what's coming next, kind of a, a, a framing for what I'm calling some decolonizing approaches to the Book of Mormon. Uh, this model that I'm working on in my book and informs these different uh, articles and is what I'm calling a neophyte interpretive model uh, of the Book of Mormon. And this model employs uh, decolonizing and scientific method methodologies to center indigenous voices in the study of the Book of Mormon. So how can we address this problem that I've been talking about, that Native voices tend to be ignored or erased in Mormon studies, and particularly in Book of Mormon studies. 
Uh, and one way to do that is to engage the scholars that are involved in Mormon, Mormon stories. And so this is a list, if you will, John, of who I would like to see on Mormon stories or other podcast communities, because these uh, scholars are having a profound impact on me. These are indigenous scholars that are reshaping the way we understand the Book of Mormon and Mormon studies. At least three have been on. Yes, there are some that have been on <laughs> and some of that have a, played a very big role on it. But at least Boxer is a Dakota scholar uh, and uh, she has an article in Essays on America. She's in both Essays on American Indian and Mormon History and Decolonizing Mormonism, along with me. Her article in Essays on American Indian and Mormon History on the Book of Mormon of Settler, Settler Colonialism is, I think, more significant, more important, more profound than my DNA article and should be soon cited more than my DNA article. I really think that everyone with a serious interest in the Book of Mormon needs to read Elise Boxer's work. Uh, and the next person I want to mention is P. Jane Hafen, the Taos Pueblo scholar I mentioned, who's the editor of Essays on American Indian and Mormon History. Uh, she is also writes the, the uh, afterword in Decolonizing Mormonism, and her work on understanding the Book of Mormon uh, through indigenous perspectives rather than uh, settler colonial perspectives, that how I mentioned the different ways of sharing stories, the, the ability to hold multiple truths, the ability to, to have multiple origins. She does the best job of articulating that uh, in, in those uh, articles. So really having a, a profound impact on me. Of course, Gina Colvin has a long history with Mormon stories and with her uh, podcast, The Thoughtful Faith, a Maori scholar who helped uh, edit the Decolonizing Mormonism. Angelo Baca, who I've mentioned several times, Danae and Hopi uh, scholar uh, who's appeared on Mormon stories with me and just finished his PhD at uh, New York University and will be uh, teaching at Ro Rhode Island uh, School of Design, uh, running the Native uh, film program there, one of the most important film schools in the nation. Wow. Uh, and uh, he's do it, just doing incredible work around Bears Ears recently. Uh, Moroni Benali, who is a, another Diné scholar who wrote an excellent article in uh, Dialogue, a journal of Mormon thought, on the blossoming or decolonizing the blossoming idea that Lamanites would blossom as the rose. Mm. He provides a, a Diné perspective based upon his grandfather and his father, whose father would play critical roles in translating the Book of Mormon to Navajo, translating the temple ceremonies to Navajo, uh, and kind of taking a Navajo or Diné perspective and rethinking uh, the idea of the blossoming as something that while the blossoming is when, as he says it, uh, Navajo Mormons embrace both their Navajo and the Mormon tradition, not as converts, not as converts, but in a conversation. And he argues that that's the perspective of his father and grandfather, that it shouldn't, our goal as Mormons should not be to engage, to convert Native people to the Book of Mormon, but to have a conversation about it, which is really profoundly different way of thinking. Uh, hmm. Daniel Hernandez, uh, or Arcia Tecun, is a Winak or Mayan uh, anthropologist uh, in New Zealand. Uh, he's done a lot of work with uh, Tongan Mormons on... Uh, the use of kava and relationships with the word of wisdom. Uh, and he has a great article in a, a new journal called Religions, uh, looking at the way that indigenous people are using the story of Samuel the Lamanite as a way to uh, respectfully, uh, but with divine mandate, challenge the church, uh, challenge settler colonial uh, readings of the Book of Mormon. Uh, and, you know, really incredible work that Daniel Hernandez is doing. Uh, 
Leticia Alvarado is somebody you definitely should be checking out. Uh, Gerardo, uh, her book, uh, Abject Performances. She's a Chicana or Latinx uh, scholar, uh, now now ex Mormon, who writes about her upbringing as in a in a Latino Mormon household, uh, and she's done incredible work with uh, Chicana artists and kind of blends this Mormon art perspective in in thinking about uh, the Book of Mormon. So just a fascinating new scholarship. Uh, also on the Latinx is Suhey Vega at Arizona State, who's doing uh, great interviews with uh, kind of oral history uh, interviews with uh, Latina women, Mormons. Uh, she is herself, or Suhey Vega is not Mormon, but she's bringing that kind of non-Mormon anthropologist perspective. Darren Perry, who's the former uh, executive director of the Northwestern Shoshone has got a great book on uh, Bear, R Bear River Massacre uh, and is going to be opening the Mormon History Association uh, meetings uh, in Logan uh, later this week. Uh, we've got Farina King, who is Diné, is doing incredible work on the Intermountain Indian School uh, and on Diné education or Navajo education. Uh, and she and Sarah Newcomb who is, should be familiar to your Mormon Stories audiences, uh, a Simshian writer, are teaming together uh, with a number of sponsors that include uh, groups as diverse as the Claremont uh, Graduate Studies in Mormon Program, the University of Utah, BYU, the Mormon Social Science Association that I'm part of. We're all together, coming together to sponsor a seminar later uh, this year on indigenous perspectives on Lamanite identity. Uh, we're, we're centering indigenous voices uh, and providing a forum and, and collaborative network for indigenous Mormons uh, and scholars doing similar work can collaborate uh, and support each other. So really big kudos to Sarah on what she's doing. In, and she got a lot of her kicking this off right here on Mormon Stories. Uh, Monica Crowfoot has an article in the, the recent issue of Dialogue on indigenous uh, issues. She's also Danae. She's an actress uh, and is writing a book on her, her personal stories uh, and just a, an incredible voice. Forrest Kutch, who is a non-Mormon, uh, Ute, and, and a, a friend of mine, he's written a book years ago called, on Utah American Indians, or edited, I should say, uh, and is got a new book uh, on native ways of giving that balances Christianity and native perspectives uh, and in, a, in a, an incredible healing moment that he co-authored with an Episcopalian uh, priest. Uh, and the last native scholar that I really, is, is my dream list to be on Mormon stories, <laughs> is a, another Dakota scholar. Her name's Kim Tallbear. She wrote a book called Native American DNA. Uh, and it is a critical analysis of the way that Native American DNA has been used in, uh, in the media, in tribal uh, identity, and in Mormon genealogical forums. Uh, so again, a non-Mormon, but it has a, some fascinating uh, ideas to, to think about, uh, for us to think about. So I, at, what I'm trying to do is engage the thinking and thought of people like this. And I want to use my time to highlight their work, if I, if I can do that. So how's that list sound to you, John? <laughs> Sounds like a bunch of brilliant people. <laughs> yeah, doing important work. And it's not just your podcast. The other podcasters that are listening to this, these are people we need to be paying attention to. We need, they, need, they need to use, to have this, the, same, the same opportunities that we're giving to white scholars, we need to be giving to these scholars. So I want to, I want to kind of respond when at the end of this episode, yeah. when it, when it, when it's okay, I want to talk to you about that proposal just for a second. Sure. When you're, when you're ready. I know you, I know there's a little bit more. Yeah, just a little bit more. So I'm going to just briefly cap what, what I mean by a neophyte perspective. So that's defined the term neophyte. Sounds a lot like a neophyte, right? Yep. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that's interesting. 
Uh, neophyte is a, a term that was in common use in the 19th century. It's still a term used today, but more often in scholarly and missionary work, actually, than in or kind of Christian missionary work more generally than in Mormon circles. Uh, but it's a term to refer to uh, native converts to Christianity. Or in the 1828 dictionary, uh, Webster's dictionary. I think it's heathen converts to Christianity. Mm. Okay, but uh, in Spanish, it's the, the, I was looking yeah. it up. Is neophyta, and nephite in Spanish would be nephita. Yeah, like really so very, close. yeah, very similar. <laughs> uh, and the idea is that neophytes have been engaging with Christianity for, in the case of Mexico. Uh, in Latin America for 300 plus years before the Book of Mormon ever came along. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and in that time, there've been a lot of native stories told and retold and rehashed. And, uh, and there's a lot of resources for thinking about native and Christian interactions in the case of the New York region where book, where, where the Book of Mormon itself comes from, there was uh, 200 or so years of interaction before Joseph Smith came along, uh, where Native people were engaging with Christianity. And we've got diaries, we've got journals, we've got uh, letters, we've got books written by Native people uh, that predate the Book of Mormon, some post-date, uh, are Native people telling their own stories in their own ways, in their own engagement with Christianity. Uh, so the the power of a neophyte model is that it moves indigenous voices to the center of the analysis. Mm -hmm. So if if we look at the Book of Mormon through a neophyte perspective, it's going to open our eyes to uh, an experience much greater than the Book of Mormon, uh, and it provide it actually. Mormons have engaged with a lot of this work. But in a way to say, to try to make it historical, or to try to make these engagements that were happening in the 16th century that right. we're going to talk about later with the Popol Vuh, they making were engagements the with the Quiche Maya and the Dominican uh, priests where they were discussing issues that would be pertinent later to the Book of Mormon. Mormons, unfortunately, lose the historical context and they want to take these conversations that were occurring in the 16th century and put them in ancient America. Right. That's not where they actually happened. Mm -hmm. They happened in the 16th century. They happened in the 19th century. They happened in the 18th century. There were conversations that were happening. And if we read the Book of Mormon within that context, we have some powerful ways of, of better understanding it. The other groups that are often called neophytes are not necessarily Christians. Although they engage with Christianity, they become entangled with Christianity. And these are the native prophetic movements uh, in the United States. And there, there were some of these in, in Latin America as well. But the ones in the United States uh, were people like Neil and the Delaware prophet uh, that precedes the, the Book of Mormon, Tenskatawa that, or the Shawnee prophet that precedes the Book of Mormon, or Handsome Lake, the Seneca prophet that also precedes the Book of Mormon. Now, notice. The, the Delaware, uh, the Shawnee, and the Seneca prophet. Those three prophets predate the Book of Mormon. And where does Joseph Smith send the first missionaries to the Lamanites? To the Seneca, to the Shawnee, to the Delaware. Mm. Is that coincidence? <laughs> Uh, yeah. Also, I. So let me yeah, just summarize ahead. what you're yeah. saying. Um, so you're saying that by the time Joseph Smith starts coming up with the idea of the Book of Mormon, starts talking about it, there had been around 200 and 300 years already where colonizers had been make like helping Native people or sometimes forcing them to engage with Christianity. Mm -hmm. So they would be, by the time Joseph Smith is born, there would be native people who would have been already converted into Christianity and even prophets, right? Like mm -hmm. Christian prophets who are native, mm -hmm. um, who or at least Joseph Smith would, yeah. have, would have heard about. 
Yeah, and they would have incorporated some Christian ideas into native teachings. Right, right. Yeah. And yeah, he that he almost definitely heard about. So like ideas like the great spirit, mm -hmm. like that's mentioned in the is it the Book of Mormon? Yeah. yeah. Um in the that's mentioned in the Book of Mormon. Those that that it's kind of like merging Christian ideas with Native American ideas. Mm -hmm. Um Joseph Smith would have heard of 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 these. Yes, and we'll go into some detail about how he would have heard of them and which ones he heard of. Uh, and I, you know, I have previously done a couple of brief introductions to these approaches in the in an interview in Mormon Book Reviews and uh, uh, on on my response to Rod Meldrum. I mentioned this stuff briefly, and then I recently was on Mormonism Live, where we did an episode called Neophytes and Lamanites in the Book of Mormon. I uh, and so that's kind of where I've shared these ideas before. In our next two episodes, we're going to take a deep dive into neophyte interpretive models. First, to look at race and gender in the Book of Mormon. We're going to find some exciting uh, new ways to think about race and gender in the Book of Mormon. And this next one on decolonizing the Book of Mormon. How do we actually uh, decolonize the Book of Mormon? How do we place indigenous voices at the center uh, of the analysis? All right. Uh, well, what a great tour of the second part of your story. And I think uh, Mormon Studies community uh, should feel really fortunate to have had you be a part of it. And I hope the Mormon Church feels proud of you, Thomas Murphy, for the way that your work and life has reflected the best impulses of the church. I hope I've represented Mormonism well, even when I wasn't the best Latter-day Saint. <laughs> um, I'll just, I'll just do the thing that I do at, at the end, uh, the, the, um, just because I take, the things you've shared seriously, but I also am trying to live in a practical world where um, you're always trying to balance like, um, you know, the church and its power and its influence with the truth claims and the historicity, which does matter to a lot of people. And then the way that minorities have all been affected and then the interest of viewership, like it's a really interesting set of dynamics to have to try and take into consideration. And so I'm going to offer an unrefined, um, an unrefined, likely semi abrasive analogy to explore one major idea that I've heard come from today's conversation. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. So <clears throat> what I hear, what I've heard you saying here is, is a, is something that I truly value. So here's what I mean by that. What I've heard all throughout the, the episode we just recorded was you saying, if you're going to engage in um, a, a field or an arena or a discipline that involves natives, you include them. You put them at the centerpiece, if possible, of history, of writing, of analysis, et cetera. Right? Yes. Yeah. And that you don't perpetuate the colonization mentality of like the white Western leader exploiting the resources of the of the minorities or of the natives extracting whatever provides value, acting like you're the leader, acting like you're the know-it-all and then just leaving the minority groups sort of ravaged or pillaged or d disempowered. Like, okay, that's yeah. my attempt in a couple, in a minute or two to reflect what I heard. Well, that and I would say that it, if, in my case, if I become the spokesperson for Native people, then I have failed right. in what I'm trying to do. Yeah, right. That they should be 
doing their own analysis. They should be telling their own stories. They should be giving, providing their own reactions. Right. Yeah, but with it, they don't have the privilege that that I have, and see, that's that's the totally. rally. that's the okay. challenge. Okay, so I'm an, I'm trying to real time be reflective about Mormon stories, not and and my involvement in it, not to be defensive, mm -hmm. but to like take seriously what I'm hearing you say and to process it a little bit. Yeah. Okay, so. Because if I if I'm not reflective on my behaviors and my track record and what I've tried to do, and also reflective about how I might even do better, which I think is a, a friendly but loving challenge you've offered, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Then I'm not taking you seriously, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm not even living the values that I claim to share. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if I think about you know, so we've been doing Mormon stories now. I've been doing Mormon stories for 17 years. Mm -hmm. um, here's, here's, here's where I'm struggling with what you've put forward a little bit as it relates to Native Americans mm -hmm. and Latinos specifically. So what I can say I've tried to do from the very beginning, whether it's with Dar Darius Gray or, you know, Darren Smith or the Losing the Lamanite series, or the LGBT community. Like, what I love about Mormon stories specifically is it's always tried to be centered on people's stories. Right. And I've always tried to interview people to tell their own story, right? Right. So in that sense, I like I like that structure. I like that, we, that, that that's the structure we kind of came up with. And I've always, whether it's transgender people, LGBT people, you know, gay, lesbian people, Native Americans, Latinos, Hispanics, Europeans, women, like I have always tried to be conscious about lifting minority voices and letting them tell their own stories. Now, I'm not saying I've been perfect at that, that the balance has been representative, but I can say that's been a value. And you did a lot better job than the Oxford Handbook of Mormons. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Yay. I exceeded a super low bar. Okay. <laughs> So, um, okay, but here's, here's the trick uh, of like what I just heard. Like you just went through a bunch of uh, Native Americans or Latinos that are doing research in Mormon studies, okay? Mm -hmm. I'm going to tell you my honest reaction to that um, is, is, in, is with a really clumsy, un, unrefined, and semi-offensive metaphor, okay? And I wasn't sure whether I should go with Lord of the Rings or like, like, um, who was the who was the financial broker in New York that defrauded all the all the people? Not it's not Jeffrey Epstein, but I could use Jeffrey Epstein. Madoff. Madoff. Yeah. yeah. Was that? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Carrie. Um, let's just say, let's just say we'll go with Bernie Madoff. Let's just say that Bernie Madoff, who let's just say was kind of a stockbroker investor kind of guy, right? Mm -hmm. And let's just say that he had he had developed this entire fraudulent pyramid, financial pyramid scheme that defrauded people of billions of dollars, right? Mm -hmm. Well, let's say that there were some traces of truth or reality in it, right? People were investing stuff and, you know, there were some investments that happened. But then it was discovered that that financial scheme was a huge fraud and it collapsed, right? Mm -hmm. I would never want to then lead or initiate or even engage in a discussion about sound financial management or investment principles in the context of sort of a Bernie Madoff, the Bernie Madoff school of financial best practices, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. As an extension of what is now known to be a super awful fraud that hurt a lot, a lot of people in really significant ways. Okay. I hope, I don't know yeah. if you see where I'm going here. Yeah, I do but, think I see. But now, now let me tell you where I'm going. Like when I think about the way that I have processed the Mormon story, and for me, this is my values. Um, for me, the fact that it was true, the fact that it was real, the fact that the Book of Mormon was sold to me as a history, the fact that Joseph the Joseph Smith story was sold to me as literally being an angel delivering golden plates that was a real history that then got 
like that, the veracity of the whole enterprise, right? The fact that Native Americans and Pacific Islanders and Latinos were all literal Lamanites, like all of that, the, the, the truthfulness of all of that was really important to me, mm -hmm. right? And it was a really important foundation for why I was so com a, such a committed Mormon. Right. But it's also, once I realized that the probability of any of that being actually real or historical or true, the fact that all that kind of disappeared for me around 2001 and in, in small part or in moderate part, thanks to you and your work, right? That left me and my and my my work with Mormon stories to be very very much centered around the the truthfulness the truth claims, which by the way I've learned is is kind of is kind of um, frowned upon in the Mormon studies community to ever even talk about truth claims or to even make references to them. It's deeply offensive and polarizing and divisive, which has put me at odds with many in the Mormon studies community for a long time because that's. That's really all that matters to me. If I had to pick one thing that matters to me, it's truth, right? And truth, truth in the in the sense of not like myth, but like, did this stuff really happen or not? And if it didn't, then then it's I agree with Gordon Hinckley. It's one of the biggest frauds ever perpetrated on mankind, right? It's not just, it's not just like, oh well, it's like Santa Claus. We can who doesn't love Christmas? You know what I mean? So I, I've always taken that really seriously, and that's been probably the main, along with social justice, mm -hmm. right? Which is important to me. Feminism is important to me. Anti-racism is important to me. LGBT community is genuinely important to me. Like it's kind of truth claims and like marginalized communities that have been harmed. That's kind of what's driven me. And along with informed consent, people deserving to know the truth so they can make informed decisions. So when I think about a bunch of these beautiful Native American and Latino scholars, right, mm -hmm. engaging in serious Mormon studies scholarship, knowing that they were all sold a Bernie Madoff-like scheme that at its root was at best the work of a pious fraud, and at worst the work of a charlatan and I'm going to just go really hard here, likely sexual predator, right? The idea of having beautiful people like Sarah or Angelo or Gina have to take seriously um, this arena and work within it like it, like it would be to like it would be to ask the people defrauded by Bernie Madoff to then attend the school of Bernie Madoff financial education. It's worse than that because these people already were displaced and killed and disrespected without Mormonism, right? Genocide level um, offenses. Then you add to that if 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 it's true that Joseph Smith was just like totally out of his league disrespecting these people in adding insult to injury with what many would say is a was probably a fraud to have them like working in the Mormons let's talk about the book of mormon finding creative ways to have them reengage the book of mormon i'm like that's like asking the people who bernie madoff defrauded to then like re-engage Bernie Madoff's story in a more creative, edifying way. It feels there's a part of me in my worldview that's privileged and all that. It feels almost insulting and degrading mm -hmm. to ask them to do that or to even like, it's like, why are you doing this? Like, no, go do amazing scholarship for native peoples, for Latinos, for, you know, but like to even have to like, Engage the Book of Mormon feels almost like a re-traumatizing request, let alone disrespectful, let alone kind of silly. Almost at the that's why I toyed with like a Lord of the Lord of the Rings, like it'd be like asking, you know, engage with the hobbits and take the idea of hobbits seriously in the real world, or elves, or dwarves, or ents, right? Like, so like 
I'm having a hard time wrapping my brain around that, not in any way to disrespect you or to disrespect them. Cause I have, I would not have given you three hours just now if I didn't deeply respect you. Right. Not that that's some big thing, but I mean, like, and I wouldn't have had Angelo and Sarah and Gina and all the losing the Lamanites people and everybody else. I wouldn't have had them on Mormon stories if I didn't deeply respect them and care about them. But I just, I worry about, I just like, I'm trying to wrap my brain around how it's not insulting to have them engaging in this conversation when if I were them, I would feel so insulted and traumatized, re-traumatized by what Mormonism has brought to Native Americans and Latinos specifically. I don't, I'm sure that's too harsh of a question and I'm sure it was offensive to like almost everybody, <laughs> but it's what I'm feeling and it's how I'm reacting when I, when I, you know, when I contemplate like more Mormon scholarship with these beautiful people, it almost feels insulting. Now, Gerardo, I want to give, do you agree? Do you not agree? Do you think it's rude what I just asked? I want to ask you before I have Thomas respond. I or can you even see what I'm saying? Yeah, I, I think I have. I was having some of those thoughts as I was reading uh, <laughs> the decolonization article. Mm -hmm. um, why does it matter? You know, like if it's not true, why does it matter to keep engaging with it and trying to make it in some way valuable myth? Um, but the, the, the more I've, I've heard, like the story you've, you've told and just considering it, I mean, I, I, I don't think nothing is like, I don't think, um, I think nothing is black and white. Right. So like it, and in some way there can be, I find some, find some beauty in in engaging with some of, of these myths and really understanding where could Joseph grabs a lot of these ideas from and really engaging with those like original um, ideas where the actual Book of Mormon was inspired from. Um, so I kind of have like conflicting thoughts about it, but I can, I definitely see where you're coming from because I, I had the same kind of thoughts. And, and just to kind of close out my, my, and this is kind of a softball because I know some of the answers to this yeah. question I'm asking, but I also want to give you a chance to answer it in a, in a meaty way. One of the most visceral offensive things I've ever contemplated in this whole Mormon stories, Mormonism space is the fact that Joseph Smith gave people a false identity about themselves that was made up. I, you know, Killing people is awful. Genocide is awful. So like, we'll say that those, you know, rape and torture, like those things are really, really awful. Like one step up from that, in my view, is like giving people a false narrative about who they are and what their identity is. Kind of like the Mound Builder myth, mm -hmm. when their own heritage is so rich and beautiful and inspiring to then give them this false racist offensive identity about themselves is like and i'm not i'm not even a person of color but like that really bothers me right so that's that's informing the passion behind mm -hmm. not just the racism of the book of mormon but and, and of the mount builder myth but just of like giving people a false identity that now for multiple generations i'm a lamanite i'm a i'm a proud soy labanito you know i'm proud mm -hmm. Like that is so offensive to me, and I'm not even a, a person of color, a Native American. So there's the softball, and I hope I haven't made you want to. <laughs> I hope I haven't made you regret coming on Mormon stories by answering that. But no, I'm being honest. No, but it, I, I have lots of thoughts running through my head. <laughs> but let me start with, you know, in in my recommendations, you can start with what you find most comfortable. Because in that list uh, are many people who have the same issues with truth claims and have had the same struggles. So helping give them voice, which you're already doing, okay? And, you know, so encouraging you to do more of that. So there's, there's common ground there. 
Okay. And to start with, let's acknowledge that, that common ground. Okay. And that's a, a great place. You know, Leticia Alvarado is the one that just really comes to my mind as one that really would resonate with what you just said. Okay. Let's, let's note that Gerardo. Yeah, yeah I know. I know. Her. Okay. Yeah. And <laughs> so those, those, those stories are, are there, but, but every one of those individuals has had to wrestle with that question. Okay. Every one of those individuals has had to wrestle with the trauma of colonialism and its representation within Mormonism and its practice within Mormonism. Okay. So uh, even those that are, that are trying to, to find positive ways of engagement uh, have dealt with the dark side of it too. Okay. I'm sure more yeah. than me. <laughs> yeah. And uh, there, there, there were two stories that came or more than two, but let's see if we can <laughs> narrow it down to two stories. <laughs> Uh, yeah, two stories that came to my mind in thinking about this. And one is one that should be familiar to Mormon folks. And this is the, the story of the Kirtland Anti-Banking Society. Okay. Uh, and so the early Mormons in Kirtland, Ohio, are trying to set up a bank. Uh, and they uh, run into some challenges, some uh, challenges on the part of the government uh, to give them and, and biases of, of of people in the area to say we don't want them to have a bank and you know could they kind of control things so they deny their application for a bank status and so mormons respond by creating the anti-baking society that does essentially the same thing that a legal banking society would do but it's not legal okay one has the pack backing of the power of the state and one doesn't. And, and, and what, you know, kind of, I think in the log, the Mormon logic is that we have the backing, of the power of God and God's more powerful than the state. Okay. Uh, in, in using that kind of logic. Well, if we look at that, the difference between the counterfeit and the real is the power of the state. Real people's lives are caught up between that struggle, okay? And power has more of an impact of what's true than what the actual banknotes or, or, or et cetera. Although there are some passages, I should say, that suggest that they gave the impression that they had more money behind the bank than they did. So when a, but the state can do that too, and they have in some cases. Uh, but just kind of on a deeper level of thinking as an anthropologist, all, all cultures are co socially constructed. All religions are socially constructed. Everyone is based upon a lie. The United States is a lie. It's a fraud. Okay. What I mean by that is it is an imagination. It's a group of people that came together to imagine that we could govern ourselves. And we called that government the United States, okay? But it doesn't really exist outside of our imagination. It's fabricated. So I would say all cultures are fabricated. All religions are fabricated. Even science is fabricated, okay? Now, science does have an advantage that I think is worth looking at, and, and this is found in many cultures, and that is that science has methods for recognizing its own fabrication, its own susceptibility uh, to being misused uh, by having processes of peer review, processes of uh, double checking, of, of being, you know, having a methodology that makes it capable of disproof, okay? that helps to correct for some of the, the fabrication that's there. But even scientific theories are themselves based upon imagined ideas, like gravity. Gravity is just a figment of our imagination. But it's a figment of our imagination to describe something that we actually experience. Okay, And so when I try to take more of a culturally relative view as an anthropologist, I would say that everybody's perspective um, ha 
has some value and and that we i what when when i say this i don't want to discourage you from continuing to pursue the truth truth claims okay because i think those are important questions they're important questions to me and the very important part of my development uh but there are deeper questions because when it really comes down to it in the end it's all socially constructed it's all made up uh, and so once we recognize that, then how do we navigate our way through it? We have no way to navigate except through metaphor and, and analogy and, uh, and, and these things that I'm going to talk about in the next couple of episodes of, of uh, ways of thinking. So that, that's kind of one story to respond. The other story is, is an, an Iroquois story, and it's the story of the great peace. And this is a part that doesn't appear in the Book of Mormon's version of the Great Peace. But let me say as a criticism first that Joseph Smith culturally appropriates this story, steals it from Iroquois people. So I agree in that that truth claim. Okay. In in uh jo- Joseph Smith is is stealing and and debasing and abusing native stories. Okay, but there are native stories behind at least this one. Okay, and in the the so in the Book of Mormon, it's the story that's in Third Nephi of Jesus coming and appearing to the Nephites. Okay, so there is a an Iroquois story of the peacemaker, who uh, in some versions of the story travels uh, to the old world and is killed there, uh, and then comes back uh, to Turtle Island, uh, where he. Uh, shows his wounds much like in the the third nephi story uh and uh has kind of that that uh manifestation of christ in america okay and and this these that's how it appears in the book of mormon if you take the iroquois versions that are not in the book of mormon okay and you're coming from that mormon worldview Okay, so I get you. I get where you're coming from in the Mormon worldview. But if you're coming from a Haudenosaunee or an Iroquois traditional worldview, you're going to see it very differently. So Hanson, or, or the, the peacemaker, the character that's appropriated as Jesus, okay, what he does in his, his travels to unite uh, the five nations, the uh, Mohawk, uh, the Oneida, the Onondaga, the Cayuga, and the Seneca, these are nations that are at war with the, with each other uh, and are killing each other and, and having all, all these these struggles uh, and in order to unite them to make a very long story short a a critical step that he has to do is he has to confront taradaho is the uh, Seneca term uh, for uh, this cannibal this horrific person uh who abuses people, he kills people, he eats people, okay? He has to confront Taradaho. And again, there's different versions of this, but in one component, one, one part of the story, in, this, this Tadada, in some versions, this is Taradaho, this, in other versions, it's Hiawatha, okay? But in, in one portion of it, uh, handsome, or I mean, excuse me, the peacemaker, uh, to confront uh, Taradaho, he climbs on top of uh, his his home and peers down through the smoke hole. And uh, Taradaho, the cannibal, uh, is cooking human flesh in the bowl. Okay. And er, er, the peacemaker's looking down through the hole and peers into here's here's the, the peacemakers up here tadadaho's down here tadadaho looks into the water and sees the reflection of the peacemaker he sees himself the peacemaker and tadadaho are interconnected they're part of each other in order to unite the nations in the later part of the story what the peacemaker has to do not only has he tried to to transform the mind of uh of the, the cannibal uh 
the Tadadaho is also the most powerful person at the center nation, Onondaga. And in order to bring the Onondaga, they're the last of the five nations to be willing to agree, and Tadadaho's refusing. Everybody else has agreed, we're going to come together, we're going to have land in common, we're going to do all the, the, those great things that appear in the Book of Mormon, and, you know, taking care of the poor, feeding the hungry, uh, having peace. Uh, we're going to do all of this. But in order to do it, he needs Tadadaho. He needs the cannibal. He needs the most abusive person you can think of the biggest fraud, the biggest fake, the biggest, the worst of humanity. In order for to create the great peace, Tadadaho and the mother of nations, I mean, the peacemaker and the mother of nations come together with Tadadaho and they say, we can accomplish this peace if you will be our leader. They asked Tadadaho to be the leader? To be the leader. Whoa. Think of the, the, the depth in this story, the depth of human psychology that's in this story. They achieve peace not by eradicating Tadadaho, not by killing him, not by destroying him, by joining with him, by uniting with him as another human being. That's my answer. I, I see a lot of beauty and wisdom in that. And if I'll just like, if I can process that real time for just a second, like a, a Democrat sees like any Trump supporter as Tararajo, right? And uh, a, a Republican sees Biden or any supporter of Bill Clinton as Tararajo. In other words, there are real monsters in the world but what's more common is seeing your adversary as a monster when they're not, they're just a person. Mm -hmm. So what, what I'm loving about that story, although I like the challenge of making a, a literal, you know, um, cannibal, <laughs> your leader, like what, what I even like more about that is just the principle of how we tend to see people on the opposing side as we tend to demonize them mm -hmm. and they are humans and we're humans and they have reasons for why they think and believe what they do. And so do we. So that challenge of teaming with the person that we view as our enemy really is the only way to peace that we'll probably ever have. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's, that's how I'm processing the practical application of that story, but I think it's profound without my, my re reinterpretation as well, a little bit more ambitious, maybe. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah, and and we can go into as as we, we can. I mean, it's like putting a, putting a putting a pedophile in charge yeah. of primary. Like that's, you know what I mean? Like that's, I wouldn't want to do that, right? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I could see I could see the practical <laughs> challenges there. Uh, <laughs> But I, there I is, love the ambitiousness. Yeah, there's a it. principle that, from a native worldview, that a lot of these scholars I've mentioned, they're operating from that worldview or something like it, something similar, because you see these sorts of teachings in in different native traditions. I uh, and so coming from that worldview is why they're very comfortable engaging. Well, for one, just at the third story that I wasn't going to say is the story that I had when I confronted that challenge uh, back in 2001, and I caught, got caught in the middle of a fight between Native men and Native women. And I was insisting that they listen to each other. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, when they refused, then I walked away. And so I didn't face trauma, right? And that's another way of telling the same story, is that when I did face the trauma and I didn't walk away, every time I saw the trauma, which kept coming back, uh, that's when I was most successful. That's when I accomplished the goals that, that I wanted to achieve. Uh, and so stare into it. 
that's the, what drives my scholarship is I take the hardest question. Why would a native person want to convert to Mormonism and go there? Or engage with it in se yeah. seriously, right? Mm -hmm. As a scholar. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty bold. I mean, that's pretty ambitious. And it's like uh, Christopher Thomas engaging with BYU and teaching there when he doesn't totally, even believe totally. the Book of Mormon <laughs> yeah. is historical. And evangelical Christians tend to view Mormonism as a cult. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of radical. Yeah. Well, I was going to ask what, what other reactions did you have to Simon's response? Thomas. Thomas's. <laughs> what did I say? <laughs> Simon. Too you're many not, people. You're not the first person to confuse <laughs> me with Simon Southerton. Oh, you said what? Simon. Uh, let me try again. I'll try again. You said, what reaction do you have to Thomas's response? Yeah. Um, I think, uh, something that's, uh, near to my heart is the LGBT topic, um, and the church. And, um, I hold a lot of, um, uh, sometimes a lot of grudge to people like, um, that, LGBT people who decide to stay in Mormonism, mm -hmm. um, even after knowing so much of the issues, after engaging with the brethren, after engaging with their their bookstore, um, and I I've often been really critical of people like Charlie Bird and Ben Schlatty and other people like that. Um, but there's all there because I think like how can they support um, this organization that does so much damage to um, um, people like me and people like themselves. Um, but at the same time, um, there's a lot of conflict because I even recognize that without them. The, the needle wouldn't move. Mm -hmm. um, and that the work that we do in Warm Stories is probably just a, as important as the work that they do. And so, I don't know. I see it like as, a, as an analogy for that. Yeah, we, we need each other. And you know, when, when I, at first I thought you were going to go to a different person. I was thinking of Troy Williams. I was going to say Troy. Equality Utah, <laughs> yeah. right? Because that I think Troy is a better analogy for what I see, how I see myself, right? Yeah. Is that, you know, as a gay man, uh, and, you know, I've known Troy since way back in the, when I was doing the DNA days and when he was really struggling with this stuff and was a student at BYU. And, uh, and, and to see what he's been able to do at Equality Utah to get passed in the Utah State Legislature protections for uh, LGBT community. And he did it by allying with the church as an out ex-Mormon. He didn't have to give up his identity. Mm -hmm. And he still did tremendous work. And he's not done. Yeah. <laughs> well, that was beautiful, Gerardo. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. <laughs> and you too, not Simon. <laughs> Thomas. <laughs> what a beautiful uh, way to conclude part two of your story. I hope you feel a little bit of respect and honor from us. We we have a lot of it, but I hope you feel at least a little of it. Oh, indeed. Good. Good. All right. Well, we'll figure out whether we could fit the next 12 <laughs> pages of content into the remaining time we have for the, today. So we'll, we'll figure that out off camera. We'll save you all that. But regardless, we're grateful, uh, Thomas, to have you on Mormon Stories. And we hope to have you back, not just today, but in the future as well, because there's still a lot of good things to discuss. So thanks for all your work and thanks for your contributions 
to our people. Thank you. I see, I, I don't know that I fully see them, but I see them enough to have great respect for you. Well, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. For yeah. All right, everyone take care, love each other, be kind to each other. And uh, we'll see you all again soon on another episode of Mormon Stories Podcast. Take care.